Okay, good evening, everybody. We're going to call this meeting to order. It's nice to see everybody here today. Thank you for joining us in the City Council Chambers. This is the regular meeting of the Encinitas City Council. It's slightly after 6 p.m. on Wednesday, October 26, 2022. It's my son's 14th birthday today, October 26, and I'm excited to be spending it here with all of you. <laughs> um, so maybe we please have a roll call. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Kranz? Here. Council Member Hensey? Here. Council Member Lyons? Here. Deputy Mayor Mosca? Here. And Mayor Blake Spear? Here. Record will show that all members of the City Council are present this evening. Okay, thank you. And I invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance. Okay, I have two special presentations and proclamations today. So the first one is for October being Arts and Humanities Month. So I will read the proclamation uh, over there and invite Michael Corrales Schmidt to join me to receive it. So this proclamation is being accepted on behalf of the Arts Commission by Michael, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. So whereas arts and culture organizations across the nation have regularly issued official proclamations on an annual basis designating October as National Arts and Humanities Month, and whereas arts agencies, which represent thousands of cultural organizations, have celebrated the value and importance of culture in the lives of Americans and the health of thriving communities during National Arts and Humanities Month for nearly 30 years. And whereas, the humanities help diverse communities across the United States explore their history and culture. And whereas, the arts and humanities embody so much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind. And whereas, the arts and humanities enhance and enrich the lives of everyone in Encinitas and across America. And whereas, the arts and humanities play a unique role in the lives of our families, our community, and our country. And whereas the city of Encinitas is committed to the investment in the expansion of visual and performing arts, public arts, and art facilities. And whereas the arts create new opportunities regionally and within the city of Encinitas, creating jobs and economic activity within their own industry and across sectors, and making our community attractive to business development. And whereas, this is the last whereas here, annually the nonprofit arts industry generates billions in revenue and economic activity activity nationally through additional spending beyond the cost of admission on items such as meals, parking, and lodging, making the arts a vital income source for local businesses. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Catherine Blakespear, mayor of the city of Encinitas, along with all of the city council members, do hereby proclaim October 2022 as Arts and Humanities Month, recognizing that culture, arts, and humanities enrich the lives of residents and visitors in the city of Encinitas, and call upon our community members to celebrate, promote, and participate in the arts and culture in Encinitas. So with that, I will hand it over to you to say a few words. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Blake Spear, and thank you, honorable council members. Uh, I am happy to accept this proclamation on behalf of the Commission for the Arts of, of the City of Encinitas. And I just wanted to share just a quick word and say that I'm really happy to live in a city and um, have the support of the council for the arts in both word and deed. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yes, and, and, and I'll just share one more thing that we, the arts community is the heartbeat of the city of Encinitas and we um, are going to be breaking ground on the Pacific View Arts Center. Uh, and that's on our agenda tonight, which we're very excited about. And so this is really a recognition of many years of work from the arts community and many other leaders, uh, elected and otherwise, to make sure that, that we do continue to prioritize having a home for the arts here in the city of Encinitas. So thank you again for all that you do on the commission and all of your fellow commissioners.
Okay, and our next proclamation here is, this is a proclamation called Imagine a Day Without Water. And I would like to invite the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego, Rosette Garcia, to join me up here. And, my colleague, and your colleague, Carol Parker. And any other colleagues you'd like to invite? If, there are, if there's anybody else you'd like to invite up, they're also welcome to come. Let me, let me read this proclamation here. So this is Imagine a Day Without Water. Whereas, there are several whereases on this one too. Imagine a Day Without Water and the Value of Water campaign is a national education campaign that brings together diverse stakeholders to highlight how water is essential, invaluable, and in need of investment. Whereas, the city of Encinitas and its approximately 60,000 residents are served by both the San Diego Water District and the Olivenheim Municipal Water District. Whereas, San Diego Water District and Olivenheim Municipal Water District work collaboratively with regional wholesale agencies, San Diego County Water Authority and Metropolitan Water Districts of Southern California, to provide a safe and reliable water supply to customers within their service area. Whereas, customers of San Diego and Olivenheim have made tremendous strides in water conservation and water use efficiency since the early 1990s. Whereas, San Diego and Olivenheim engage in regional initiatives which provide viable, environmentally responsible, and cost-effective alternative sources of water supply, including potable reuse and recycled water. Whereas, accordant with the City of Encinitas' Climate Action Plan, the San, San Diego and Olivenheim Municipal Water Districts provide customers with recycled water for irrigation and commercial uses to make efficient use of potable water. And this is the last whereas. Whereas, San Diego Water District and Olivenheim Municipal Water District continue taking proactive steps to encourage additional water conservation and water use efficiency through various programs, communication campaigns, in-person outreach, and by offering and promoting water-saving rebates and incentives through Southern California Water Smart, Smart. So therefore, be it resolved that the Mayor and the City Council of Encinitas proclaim October 20th, 2022 as Imagine a Day Without Water, in Encinitas and recognize that water is essential to life and to the well-being of Encinitas. So thank you for joining us and I'd like to invite you to say a few words. Sure, thank you Mayor uh, Blakespear and also to the Honorable City Council members um, for uh, taking up this request on, beha on behalf of the League of Women Voters to um, participate in this Imagine a Day Without Water. It, the purpose is to raise awareness among the public and we know that our municipal water districts and the City, of, city Council have have been involved in that and that we are, we, we want everyone, as I'm sure you know, but to really think about what a precious resource water is and, and the issue that we have in California and locally um, with regards to water resources. So thank you very much. I don't know, Carol, if you wanted to say. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're on to oral communications. Mayor, we do have 18. Um, I will call you three at a time, and just a reminder that you do have three minutes. And, and so just a reminder, we do 30 minutes of public comment at the beginning, the timer, right? and then after, if we go over 30 minutes, we do the rest of it at the end of the agenda. Okay, I'll call you three at a time. First is Harbor Verk, Marilyn Ambrose, and then Tom McGinnis. safety concerns I have. I don't know, if over 16 plus years I've tried my best to communicate, um, you know, and be a, a steward of downtown and at the 7-Eleven and living here and surfing at Swami's. I'm at the point where I just don't think that the city's prioritizing public safety. And I'm somewhat upset about the fact that um, residents and business owners have to 
put themselves in harm's way to keep our town safe. Um, we have an incredibly um, difficult time dealing with violent, mentally ill and drug addicted people. I, I actually have a PowerPoint or like a, a thing I'd like to show you. Um, this is one gentleman, and I don't know if you can read that, but that's the number of times that person was contacted, um, dealt with, you know, through the sheriff's department, and then just got dropped right off at 7-Eleven to break windows and pull knives and harass employees. Um, we can go to the next one. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is this is a this is a, a person that uh, attempted to assault me at Swami's when I was coming back from a surf because he was kicked out of my store. And my question is, why are these people allowed to live downtown when they have a record like this? It's basically a, a time bomb waiting to happen. Um, and then just recently, you know, a, a fellow business owner and friend of mine got shot and almost died from a, from a mentally ill transient. And, and, and so my point is, it's not compassionate to, to not deal with this problem. It is a severe problem downtown. Um, I know that the city of Oceanside has added 24-7 enforcement downtown because the business owners requested it. And my question is, what is the city doing, and why are we being tasked with this enormous task? Like, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not certified in, in to, to be able to defend myself. My employees have been harassed and threatened. My manager, who's a woman, has two young kids, was stabbed last year in the morning at 8 a.m. It's just, I, 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 I just don't think that we're doing enough, and I, I'm, I would like the city to take this seriously. I would like it to be on the next agenda uh, for the city council meeting, and I'd like to see what can be done, because we're just not doing enough, and I, I've been here for a long time. I've tried my best, and I'm exhausted. So thank you. Madam City Manager, is there an opportunity soon to hear from the Sheriff's Captain about um, the situation that was just described and steps that we might be able to take? Um, I, we have not tasked anybody with their own public safety. We have, in fact, um, a Sheriff's Department that is responsible for providing public safety. So I would love to hear um, from the experts in that. Good evening, uh, Mayor Blake Spear and the rest of the Encinitas City Council. I'll be brief and direct. Last week I presented early, was polite and respectful, and yet was shockingly disappointed at your unanimous vote of five to nothing, rejecting all our pleas from longtime sincere residents who took valuable time and research looking for the truth. I was naive in thinking you all were listening to us. The stone wall faces should have been my clue of total denial of logic and blatant rejection of our appeal. Mayor Blakesmere, your statement that just about all small towns up and down the California coast and inland were jumping on your bandwagon promoting Prop 1 was a big, fat lie. Vista and San Marcos are just two nearby towns which recently defeated Prop 1 support on their town's agendas, stating it was a divisive proposal and out of their lawful purview. This was our suggestion from the start. Get rid of it. This evil edict is being recognized 
by more and more of your constituents as something we do not want in our state, let alone becoming a sanctuary, which is defined as a holy ground for abortion. What an oxymoron. Distrust for sure is rampant throughout the state. And all of you should be ashamed to have followed like sheep under Blake Spears' lead. None of you will get my vote for this and future elections. Sorry. Next, next speaker is Tom McGinnis, followed by Ann McGinnis, and then Maureen Hammock. Good evening. Uh, after attending last week's council meeting, when you approved the mayor's resolution to support Proposition 1, I had some additional thoughts uh, to share. Uh, I noticed that you begin the city council meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance, reciting the words, One Nation Under God seemingly acknowledging there is a God who created life. Yet, you seem to be playing God and recommending low-income mothers abort their babies. Every time I see a Blake Spear for State Senate ad, I am reminded that her campaign is being funded by Planned Parenthood. One is prone to ask, does Planned Parenthood, who bills itself as a health care provider, have goals for specific services it provides? Well, according to former uh, Planned Parenthood manager, Abby Johnson, she's quoted, for my clinic specifically, we were required to perform 1,135 abortions per year, so we're selling those abortions to pregnant women who are coming in. At Planned Parenthood, one of their mottos is that every telephone call, every client visit must be turned into a revenue-generating visit. Well, the only way to make a profit off a pregnant woman is to sell her an abortion because Planned Parenthood doesn't provide any prenatal care. So Planned Parenthood operates a business with sales goals. As we know, Planned Parenthood was founded by Margaret Sanger with the nefarious goal of significantly reducing population growth among minorities. Planned Parenthood continues to counsel lower-income women to have abortions. Minorities... Blacks and browns make up a significant percentage, if not the majority, of low-income Americans. This is direct targeting based on race. And being associated with this organization, particularly taking money from it, has to be viewed as racist. This entire council, all five of you, are on record supporting the mayor's resolution. A resolution promoting abortion is essentially the only choice for a low-income pregnant minority woman, continuing to satisfy Margaret Sanger's goal of significantly reducing minority populations. The citizens of Encinitas should not be subjected to recommendations from a city council unanimously endorsing any form of race-based politics. Please add this to the, uh, the agenda tonight to remove and overturn this resolution. Good evening, everyone. I'm here for the same reason this evening. I'm requesting that you redo, resubmit the resolution and put it on the agenda again and rescind it. Because we were misled when we were here. We were misled to believe that other cities had approved it. And you know Vista and San Marcos have not. And you know why they have not, because it's decisive. If you remember, you, I know you remember all our arguments. It doesn't really matter because you already had your decision set. I plead that you come back, put it on the agenda again, and listen and make your own decisions. Do you know that one of the things that was not talked about was that not only does Prop 1 uh, allow for abortion up until the moment of birth, but it also is against our religious freedom, against because 
uh, doctors and hospitals will be required to perform abortions. That means all our Catholic hospitals and our Catholic doctors will be shut down. So why in the world is our own city supporting something that is against the religious freedom of so many people that live here or live in San Diego County? So I request that you put it on the agenda again and rescind it because it's against our civil rights and it also is a conflict of interest for Mayor Blake Spear. Thank you. Next speaker is Maureen Hammock, followed by Robert Hickey, and then Tom Adams. Hi. I'm here to get on the record my objection to your passage of the resolution 12A last week. As you know, abortion is now the purview of the states. California is a pro-choice state and is under no risk of not being one. In fact, California has one of the most pro-abortion policies in any state, and you know that's true. Not my opinion, it's true. You start your resolution with a straw man argument that California, like some other states, might pass anti-abortion laws, which is ridiculous, and you know it. As a state, we are not having an argument between pro-life and pro-choice. The argument before us is between pro-choice and pro-abortion, two profoundly different things. The pro-abortion position that you advocate in your resolution is the extreme position in this debate. Most people don't support this extreme position. Studies show this, even in California, even in Encinitas. We don't support the extreme position of full-term abortion. We just don't. But we will have the opportunity to vote on that next week. So my point is this. This is not an issue for this council. By the way, Mayor, to their point as well. Councils take up issues like this all the time is what you said. But what you ad, ad, uh, did not admit last week that, of course, we all looked up. San Marcos and Vista either tabled the resolution indefinitely or rejected it outright. Why? Because it's divisive, extreme, and a nonpartisan issue. Therefore, it shouldn't be in front of the council. There is no good reason why you codified this extreme abortion position on behalf of the taxpayers of Encinitas, us. One can only deduce that you did so based on your own personal view of the belief that this maybe will help your electoral viability. I don't know, it's one or the other. Ironically, unless you rescind 12A, those of you seeking a higher office now or in the future will lose my vote. Uh, Bob Hickey, um, a 37 year resident of California, 22 years here in Encinitas. <clears throat> I'm basically on the same bandwagon. Uh, I was really disturbed at what I saw last week. It's because it was just like a kabuki theater. We gave our testimony. You didn't give us any reasons, valid reasons, for your voting for this proposition. I would like to see uh, 12A rescinded. Uh, two seconds. Give an idea, to give you an idea where I'm coming from, is a catechism of the Catholic Church. The catechism is basically uh, the rules where we're guided by. When you go to abortion, it said 20, 2270, human life must be re respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. 
From the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is invaluable right to ever innocent being of life. They have quotes from Jeremiah. Before I formed you in a womb, I knew you. and Before you were born, I consecrated you. Psalm 139, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Since the first century of the church has affirmed the moral evil of, ever, of every procured abortion, this teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. Direct abortions, that is to say, abortions willed either as an end or as a mean, as a grave, is gravely contrary to the moral law, not just Catholic law, moral law. What this proposition is going is basically heading towards infanticide. Let me give you a little definition of infanticide. This comes from Wikipedia. Infanticide is the intentional killing of infants or offspring. Infanticide was a widespread practice throughout human history, and that was mainly used to dispose of unwanted children. Its main purpose is the prevention of resources being spent on weak or, dis dis uh, or disabled offspring. Unwanted innocence, I'll give you one thing. If you want to find what you're doing, watch this video. Thank you for your comment, Dr. sir. Dr. Guznell. Thank you. Next speaker is Tom Adams, followed by Deborah Molina, and then John Afshari. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Adams. I've been an Encinitas resident for 27 years. I am a recent convert to the Catholic faith at age 74. That was about two years ago. Uh, I think we have a quandary here. As I understand it, and from the information I have, Margaret Sanger was one of the founders of Planned Parenthood. And I would like to compare briefly comments that she made versus the comments of St. Mother Teresa. And you be the judge of your own soul on which one you would rather support. Uh, black soldiers and Jews are a menace to the race. Margaret Sanger, well, I'm not black and I'm not Jewish, but I sure as hell am a soldier. But in three wars, in combat, and I find that distasteful. Mother Teresa, the greatest destroyer of peace is abortion. The most merciful thing a large family can do to one of its infant members is to kill it. Margaret Sanger. We must not be surprised when we hear the, of murders, killings, of wars, or of hatred. If a mother can kill her own child, what is left but for us to kill each other? St. Mother Teresa. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use violence to get what they want. The masses, I don't want to, no need to say that one, covertly invest in non-white areas, invest in ghetto abortion clinics, help to raise money for free abortions in primarily non-white areas, perhaps abortion clinic syndicates throughout North America that primarily operate in non-white areas and receive tax support should be promoted. Margaret Sanger, the last one. Abortion kills twice. It kills the body of the baby and it kills the conscience of the mother. Abortion is profoundly anti-women. Three quarters of its victims are women. Half the babies and all of the mothers. Saint Mother Teresa. I would say Think long and hard 
about putting it on the agenda and making a different vote. Otherwise, let your conscience be your guide. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Deborah Molina, and I am a 43-year resident of Encinitas in California. Um, I live five minutes from the downtown, and I rent three properties on the 101 and uh, East Street between D and E. Um, I share the wall with Bobby Burke and 7-Eleven, and I too, along with my daughter, who is my business partner, um, have been given the task of defending ourselves and our staff and our customers against the mentally ill, the homeless, and the dangerous people who are residing on our streets. Uh, we deal with it daily. We call the sheriffs almost daily. I'm sure the sheriffs that are here tonight know who we are. And we call because our safety is at risk. Our customer's safety is at risk. Sometimes I have to close the doors of my business and call the sheriff and wait for them to arrive before people can even leave. I'm having a hard time due to COVID keeping my business open because of lack of employees. And the few employees that I do have are feeling threatened and frightened. Now that we're talking about enforcing the parking, my employees are gonna to have to walk to parking lots that are not included in the two hour parking. And they're gonna be putting themselves at risk walking by the homeless. The corridor that we're talking about, I think has affected the most in downtown Encinitas. And I'd like you to know some of the more graphic incidents that I've had to deal with. Pretty much daily, we don't know what we're gonna find in the alcoves of our business. I own Coast Highway Trading which has two alcoves and two addresses. We have a man who lives there who's very dangerous, schizophrenic, and very violent. Um, I've come up to my business and the front entryway, double doors and entire glass frontage have been smeared with fecal matter. And then moments later, I have a man come up and offer to clean it up for $10. Well, of course, I'm assuming that was the man who did it. We come to urination piles, defecation piles, food, trash, littering, graffiti on the murals in the front and the rear of our businesses up and down 101. We're threatened daily for our safety. We're given the finger. We have vile, disgusting language screamed at us, passerbys, and the people inside my store. Here are some of the few incidents that I've had to deal with in the last week. I had a father with his little girl in my, in my store, and I heard the little girl say, Daddy, I'm scared, we need to go. That's because there was a violent man outside my window screaming, hitting the pole. I had a mom who was shopping in there who told me she was passing time because her daughter was a quarter block away and our sleepy downtown in Sanitas is no longer safe. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Next speakers, John F. Shari, followed by Mark Wilcox. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'm speaking on behalf of several of the special needs people that I work with that live within two miles of this area and who are constantly being inundated when they cruise in their town by homeless people who are more and more and more prevalent in our local areas. I'm also speaking from the standpoint of being a local surfer and in the local beach parks and parking lots we have a definite increase of homeless people or people living in their vans people living in their vans and just up to nefarious activities. I would be a proponent of increasing the downtown patrols. I would like to appreciate this sheriff because I've seen him many times handling such these situations. I've called before and he's been the one who showed up. Really appreciate that. I would also really be a proponent of changing the parking situation at Swami's and maybe the Moonlight area. I think meters even though they would cost me money, I think meters would really help the situation. I think it would keep people from clogging up these areas, and I think that it would cause 
two hour increments to be then instituted in these areas that need to have a turnover. I'd also like to appreciate all of you for your service in our public, as public servants. I think it's shameful that all this is happening right here. I've not been involved in all this and outside of this political arena, but I just want to appreciate you guys and say I'm sorry for the way that my fellow citizens are wasting your time. Mark Wilcox will be followed by Trina Priest. Good evening, City Council. <clears throat> I am Mark Wilcox, a father, grandfather, and advocate for youth. I know that Encinitas has Measure L on the ballot that will tax marijuana businesses in the city. I support taxing these mar marijuana storefronts. However, I have two cautions. One, do not expect that a tax on marijuana businesses will mitigate the problem that those pot shops will be bringing regarding the health and safety of our citizens who are already struggling from drug use and our children as they see marijuana in a commercial and retail setting. Typically, drug-seeking behavior begins early on in the young teen years. Teens viewing the marijuana advertising and promotions concerning candy-like edibles or fruit-flavored vapes think they are short-time solutions for anxiety, depression, and daily challenges that we all face. Two, do not believe for one minute the big lie that marijuana businesses will eliminate or reduce black market sales because the black market is rampant in San Diego County. A report from the county indicated that the Sheriff's Department has served more than 100 search warrants at unpermitted dispensaries, hazardous THC extraction labs, and chaotic, smelly, and noisy cultivation facilities, and refers, referred dozens of cases to the district attorney's office regarding drug sales and firearms violations. Exposés at the LA Times consistently all this year have demonstrated that the black market always increases in the areas where marijuana businesses are permitted and does not decrease. The underground market in California is far too entrenched with dealer-customer arrangements going back decades. Using the black market as the reason to permit more marijuana businesses has just been a smokescreen for making money off disease and addiction. Since the city put marijuana tax on the ballot, perhaps we could now take a further step and eliminate flavored marijuana products as we have done with tobacco products. Let's start now. Thanks. Uh, good evening, Encinita City Council, and happy Red Ribbon Week. Uh, I am a parent and a middle school educator, and our school has been abuzz this week with Red Ribbon Week activities uh, planned by our PTAs and our Red Ribbon, Ribbon Week chairs and by our students. These Red Ribbon Week PTA chairs met together to coordinate their activities across the city of Encinitas and also into Carlsbad. My students were excited by the Red Ribbon Week proclamations they received from the Carlsbad City Council. I want to acknowledge that as an educator, the volunteers and nonprofit organizations that serve young people are priceless. And we're working together to find ways to mitigate drug use that also exasperates the mental health crisis that we're seeing seeing in our schools. A special interest has been the important work of Radies Children Hospital, which I have mentioned before, who are fundraising aggressively to expand their facility where their treatment beds have been perennially full. In a recent news article, this was described, quote, in the past five years, the number of psychiatric visits to Radies has gone from 250 per year to 250 per month. Between July 2021 and June of this year, Radies children saw 4,479 pediatric patients experiencing behavioral health crises. Of them, 32% were triaged to the psychiatric emergency department. These numbers are alarming. A marriage and family therapist reported, quote, while it is incredibly important to reach young people through schools and pediatrician's offices before things become a bigger fire, the reality is kids are showing up in their 
uh, showing up in their teens in huge numbers for the first time with an emergency at Rady Children's. Now that the first steps have taken place that will bring four marijuana storefronts to Encinitas, our parents, educators, and nonprofits, and this city council need to be focused on our youth. As my father, a pharmacist, always said, legalizing something harmful never removes the harm. It just changes the legal consequences, consequences, usually for those who promote, produce, or in any other way profit financially from the legalized substance or activity with little to no regard for the negative impact on individuals or our society at large. Thank you. Ma'am. Ma'am, I just wanted to, to mention, if you would like uh, proclamations or recognitions from the city of Encinitas, we're happy to provide them, and you can just uh, talk to the city staff about it, either this, this month in October or next year, whatever works best for you. Yeah. Mayor, that was 30 minutes of um, public comments. We do have seven remaining. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you to the public comments tonight. Uh, we'll take the remaining public comments at the end of the agenda item or at the end of the agenda. Um, the next item is a report from closed session. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As to the first, as to the first item, there was no reportable action. As to the second item, um, risk of litigation, there was no reportable action to report. Um, as to the third item, um, the city council will be agendizing um, the city manager's agreement with the city manager for amendment and potential extension at a future public meeting. Okay, thank you for the report. Do we have any changes to the agenda? We have no changes to the posted agenda. We're moving to consent calendar. Um, we do have a public speaker on item 8J. Okay, I would entertain a motion on the balance. So moved. Second. Motion carries unanimously. Takes us to item 8J, and the speaker is Ron Dodge. Good evening, Council, Mayor Blake Spear, Deputy Mayor Mosca, and uh, Council Members Lines, Enzi, and uh, Kranz. Uh, my name is Ron Dodge, um, resident of uh, Encinitas, and these become necessary at a certain point. Um, yeah, in full disclosure, I'm a member of the uh, El Camino Real Specific Plan Task Force um, as an area resident. Uh, but I'm speaking as a private citizen tonight. Um, I strongly support uh, this uh, Z crossing that will enhance the walkability of uh, El Camino Real. Uh, I have uh, been an advocate for uh, El Camino uh, uh, improvements for years. Uh, in June 27th of uh, 2017, I participated in a uh, city organized walking tour of the, uh, um, uh, of the, uh, including uh, members of the city council, uh, city staff, residents uh, from throughout the city, and uh, renowned nationally recognized walkability, light bikeability authority, uh, Dan Burden. We proceeded north uh, along Encinitas Boulevard, and uh, Mr. Burden analyzed uh, numerous walkability and bikeability uh, driving and uh, safety issues and potential solutions, um, including the crosswalk at Mountain Vista from the southeast to the southwest corner and uh, several extraordinarily wide driveways, and uh, introducing uh, Z-crossings in mid -block, uh, for mid-block crossings. Um, the subject does uh, crossing between uh, the uh, vil uh, Encinitas Village and the uh, Encinitas Marketplace, uh, Ralphs and Coles uh, is the way I identify them, and how I know them, um, in the mid-block mid be uh, between Encinitas Boulevard and uh, Via Mo uh, Molina, was approved by a traffic commission uh, about three and a half years ago uh, in March of 19. Uh, this uh, Z crossing is much safer uh, pedestrian crossing between uh, the two uh, uh, busiest malls and uh, t uh, two of the busiest malls and um, two bus stops directly opposite each other on El Camino. 
Um, it's been a long process, and I'm anxious to see the, the crossing implemented. Um, and it's great to see uh, city funding leveraged to, uh, what, eight to one with, uh, with a cooperative uh, um, grant. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your comments, Ron. You're welcome. I would entertain a motion on this item. I just have one comment, uh, but I'll move the uh, staff's recommendation. I just want to thank Ron Dodge for, for his years of uh, assistance and, and also his focus on making El Camino Real Corridor, especially El Camino Real Corridor, but many other streets in our city, as safe as possible for those that live uh, along the corridor and travel to the uh, corridor. Uh, it's important, this, this, um, this mid-block crossing is important. As Ron highlighted, uh, this was something that we identified as a problem years ago. And so finally we have some, some, uh, some additional grant money and city money that we can put toward this. Uh, and this is just one step uh, toward uh, increasing the, the, the safety of this corridor and making it uh, such that, that people feel like they can actually walk the corridor ride their bikes on the corridor and, and really visit the corridor and all the businesses along that corridor without having to get in their car uh, to do so. And that's gonna absolutely decrease the amount of traffic, traffic congestion and speeds that we see in that corridor. So I'm happy to move this item. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Kranz. I will second it and I will point out that uh, I was on that walk with, with Ron in 2017 and I think we witnessed two people uh, illegally cross mid-block, which was one of the things that brought up the idea of a mid-block crossing. So, um, you know, the fact that it's being paid for with um, the grant funding, I think, uh, is the, the, the best part of this. And my hope is that we can obtain even more grant funding for pedestrian and bicycle improvements throughout our community. Great. Let's go ahead and vote on the motion in the second. Motion carries unanimously. Takes us to action item 10A. Okay, thank you. So 10A is a public hearing to consider the introduction of draft city council ordinance. And I see we already have our staff sitting over there. So I will hand it over to you, Melinda and Roy, to take this item. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Deputy Mayor, City Council members, and members of the public. I'm Melinda Dacey. I am the project planner that's taking over the SB9 implementation ordinance for the city. So just to provide some quick background, SB9 is the urban lot split to unit development law that was put into place by the state in 2021, and it was effective January 1st, 2022. This is a mandatory state law for the cities to in California to implement. So what this law does is it provides a ministerial approval process for qualifying two unit residential developments within single family residential zones. It also allows for a ministerial approval process for a parcel map to do a lot split of a single family residentially zoned property. This law also amends the timing of map extensions and expirations. So some of our city actions to date, so city staff had presented an informational item to the city council back in November of 2021. This was just to provide council with information regarding this law that was coming um, into play in the beginning of the year. And at that time, council directed staff to come back and prepare an urgency ordinance to implement standards for the city to have that in place when the law went into place. So later on in January, we also did another urgency ordinance for the calendar year of 2022, which is set to expire December 15th, but it also had an optional 12 month extension. And after that was put in place, city staff had also prepared and the application materials that were needed, as well as uh, updated website for SB9 implementation for public to have access to information. And staff presented a Joint City Council and Planning Commission study session in March. And from there, city staff had also presented to the Planning Commission some study sessions with some um, lot analyses for the single family residential zone properties within the city. And based off of those study sessions and feedback from the Planning Commissioners, staff had prepared an ordinance for the Planning Commission review. We had some feedback from that and went back to the Planning Commission on October 6th 
and they recommended approval to city council. So we're here this evening to go over the draft ordinance. Um, some other additional information related to SB 9 is regarding the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA in that it does not apply to any duplex approvals or urban lot split approvals or any ordinances implementing duplex and lot split provisions. Can I, can I be clear? So this is the effect that SB 9 has had on CEQA, the Coastal Act, and the Housing Crisis Act. This is um, just discussing the other applicable laws that are also in conjunction with SB 9. So we do have to do CEQA analyses for projects that come in, and um, SB 9 did carve out some CEQA exemptions for those specific projects. Some, but projects. not all. There's still, come, there's still some review CEQA analysis. That's correct. Okay. Um, additionally, the Coastal Act, um, since we are a coastal city, it does apply. Um, so coastal development permits are also required for the developments of urban lot splits and SB 9 to unit developments. Um, additionally, SB 330, the Housing Crisis Act, does also apply. Um, it requires that uh, the ordinance that we implement does not reduce the intensity or land use of a project and it includes reductions height, lot coverage, floor area ratio, increased open space and setbacks, and it's also subject to the Permit Streamlining Act. So what kind of projects apply for, qualify for a two unit development? So all of our single family residential zoned properties are identified on the screen. It's all of our RR lots, R3, R5, R8, and RS11. R11 is not included in this list because it already allows for multifamily residential development. So just to keep that clear for everybody. Um, so pro properties that cannot be developed under a two unit development or urban lot split is prime farmland, any kind of wetland area, any kind of conservation easement in relation to wetlands or other types of conservation easements or habitat that's identified with protected species. There are other areas where development can be allowed provided that they meet the city's requirements such as the very high fire hazard zone. The city has fire safety measures in place for development in those areas as well as a hazardous waste site, uh, earthquake fault zone and within the 100 year floodplain. So this is just a map showing all of the constraints that were just discussed regarding fire zone, floodways, wetlands, as well as underlying zoning information. So what projects can also qualify? Uh, the site cannot be a historic landmark or located within a historic district. The project would not alter or demolish a deed-restricted affordable housing unit, a rent-controlled housing unit, any housing that had invoked the Ellis Act in the last 15 years, or any housing that has been occupied by a tenant within the last three years. A project cannot also demolish more than 25% of the exterior walls, um, unless it's, there's an exception identified by the city. So additional qualifications for a project that result in the lot split, you have to have at least a 50-50 mix or 60-40 minimum. And each new lot that is created has to have a minimum lot size of 1,200 square feet. And so that would result in a minimum lot size of 2,400 square feet that can be eligible for a lot split. And if they were to do a 60-40 split, it would be 3,000 square feet. So a lot split was not established prior through the SB9 process. And neither the owner nor any person acting in concert with the owner has previously subdivided an adjacent parcel through an SB9 lot split. And the requirements required for two residential units on a single lot. So we wanted to break down the urgency ordinance that we had in place and show the changes that we worked on with the planning commission and to kind of display what is new to the urgency ordinance and additional information that we are proposing within the draft ordinance. So we do have definitions. So we have acting in concert with the owner, adjacent parcel, common ownership. We've added low income household, 
sufficient for separate conveyance, single family zone, urban lot split, very low income households, and then um, we also have ministerial and two unit residential development defined in our ordinance. And these are defined in our ordinance because they weren't defined in the state law. And so this provides the city staff with more clarification on how to implement. So the number of units, there isn't really a change here. Um, when city staff did present to city council originally, uh, there was discussion at that time that ADUs did not necessarily apply, but we had received some guidance from HCD that said that accessory dwelling units can be applied in an urban lot split or two unit development project. So in our ordinance, we did specify that there's a four unit maximum per lot with two primary units and then up to two accessory dwelling units or one accessory dwelling unit per primary unit. Sorry, could I just go, jump in and ask a question at this point? So I found this part of the staff report a little bit confusing. So what we directed and then that was modified at the Planning Commission and now we're recommending what is required under state law. Is that is that what's actually happened under this part? Yeah, so state law wasn't ex ex it wasn't entirely clear on the ADU provisions. However, HCD, HCD did provide guidance and technical assistance indicating that accessory dwelling units are also required when there's a two unit, or not required, I'm sorry, that they can also include those in the development of a two unit or urban lot split if, they, if the applicant so chooses. And didn't, is, did the council say some, didn't the council say that originally or what did we say originally? Yeah, so previously with the urgency ordinance, we did have the accessory dwelling units as being allowed with a development, so that hasn't changed. Okay, but then the Planning Commission tried to change that, and then we got HCD's response. Is that what happened? Not Ro Roy? entirely familiar okay. with the, that whole back and forth, but that could be what happened. Um, so after the City Council approved the urgency ordinance, uh, we got, like, Melinda said that the HCD issued technical assistance guidelines uh, to further uh, clarify the, the law, uh, specifically related to ADUs, that there's some tweaks and changes and nuances that we, when we originally presented to the council, it was different, but then the technical guidance came out and then we corrected it when we went to the planning commission. Okay. So if we're so. doing, if you're recommending anything here that HCD does not support or you think is a technical shift on what HCD, please flag that for us. Yes. So everything that we're presenting tonight and we're recommending is consistent with uh, HCD's technical okay. assistant guidelines. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah, so based off of the lot analysis that was presented to the planning commission, um, previously in the urgency ordinance, the setbacks were identified by the zone or they could be reduced up to four feet to accommodate two 800 square foot units. Um, after the technical guidance from HCD, they did indicate that four foot rear and side yards are the minimum required for the properties. Um, based off of that information and the lot analysis, um, the Planning Commission felt that the rear yard could also be reduced further to a zero rear setback, provided that the lot was 100 feet long or less in length, that they had alley access. They would also be able to provide the required parking for each unit, and that it would also need to be a project that was doing a lot split and a two-unit development in conjunction with each other. Um, additionally, the four foot side yard setback with lots that were 40 feet wide or less became very constrained and you had narrow buildings that couldn't accommodate an 800 square foot unit or two units. Um, so the planning commission felt that it was prudent to also allow a zero setback flexibility with a two unit development and an urban lot split combined with that zero setback line being the new proposed lot line. Additionally, the height of the zone requirements, that has not changed. There was also a 16 foot maximum height for structures located within the underlying zone required setbacks. So for example, if you had a structure that was 
building out to the four foot rear yard, but their underlying rear yard setback is 20 feet. They would have been limited to a 16 foot height in that area. However, with the lot analysis, there are some sites that are too constrained to still accommodate that. And so the height may be increased to the underlying zone within those areas just to accommodate the two 800 square foot units. Additionally, with lot coverage and floor area ratio in the urgency ordinance, that was also identified to have to meet the requirements of the underlying zone for which a development is proposed. However, based off of the lot analysis on some of those smaller constrained lots, that was infeasible. And so the um, planning commission determined that floor area ratio should not be required when those kind of development projects come into play and that the lot coverage shall also not be changed, but that they also specified that a pervious surface area of 75% be provided on the site um, with the remaining lot area that was open. Additionally, with parking, the parking requirements had not changed. Um, however, the parking spaces shall not be obstructed for the other spaces and they did allow for a tandem parking to be permitted on lots that were 40 feet wide or less. And that was the only way to accommodate the, the parking requirements on site for some of the lot analyses. So we also have additional requirements in our proposed draft ordinance that are not in the state law. And these are important to highlight because these are the city's implementing requirements for the ordinance. So we did incorporate affordable housing requirements, and this is only for a development that is proposing four units. So they do have to provide a inclusionary affordable housing unit. So it would be in perpetuity in one of the accessory dwelling units proposed on the site. We are also implementing trash and storage requirements, addressing requirements, a pathway requirement to all entryways in common areas, we are also incorporating requirements for stormwater management and landscaping. In addition to some privacy standards and private open space requirements, as well as requirements for utilities. We had also included requirements for design review if any kind of application was requesting any exception, variance, or waiver from any of the requested de development and design standards. And also specified some reasons for denial of an application. So with that, the staff's recommended action for city council is to introduce city council ordinance number 2022-17, titled an or ordinance of the city council of the city of Encinitas, adding a new chapter 30.18, two unit development and urban lot split regulations to title 30 of the Encinitas Municipal Code, and to also <coughs> amend section 6.05 of the Encinitas Ranch specific plan, thereby amending the implementation plan of the local coastal pro program pertaining to SB9 implementation regulations. And this concludes staff's presentation and we're available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. I just have a uh, preliminary question about the affordable requirement. So I don't, doesn't the rest of our ordinance say that our inclusionary ordinance requires it at seven units? Is that right? That's correct. So in every other development in the city, a developer has to have one deed restricted unit when they get to seven. But here, if they're creating four units, one of them has to be deed restricted affordable. Is that what is that what this is saying? Yes. That is correct. Um, there's also provisions for in our inclusionary ordinance for uh, six or less development. Um, and this proposal is consistent with that uh, provision in our inclusionary ordinance for six or less. Uh, it does provide an option to um, pay an in lieu fee. Uh, there's six or less is still subject to our inclusionary ordinance and are required to provide some uh, affordability and they could utilize ADUs to satisfy that requirement. Uh, they also have the option to pay the fee. In this case, we're because it's a city imposed requirement, we're saying, we're, or we're at least we're recommending that we require one of the ADUs to be affordable and preclude them from having the option to pay the in lieu fee. So 
what's being presented tonight is consistent with our inclusionary ordinance for six or less. Okay, uh, so let me just repeat what I think you just said, which is for six or less, they can, any development can pay the, in lieu fee, not build the affordable unit on site, but for a, an SB9 lot split, they cannot pay the in lieu fee, they have to build the affordable unit on site. And the, use the ADU as the affordable. Well, what if they don't have an ADU? Then they don't qualify. So they, the SB9 would only allow you to build two primary units and two ADU units. If you don't propose four units, then you would not be subject to the affordable requirement for the SB9. The recommendation is only for SB9 development that, it, um, that has four units. Okay. Total. And is the, um, is the, on-site affordable unit deed restricted in perpetuity? That's correct. Okay, okay, thank you for answering those questions. Deputy Mayor Mosca. And, and that's, that's consistent with our housing element sites as well. I mean, I think we, we, we also treat for a similar reason that you're getting an up zone within our housing element. Those sites, you can't, you can't pay a fee and then export your affordable housing um, responsibilities. So this is consistent with that as well. Uh, this is unique because it's six or less. Uh, for all of our housing element sites, it's seven or more, and they would not have the option of paying the fee. They would have to provide the affordable units. To, for the most part, um, because most of our housing element sites are subject to density bonus, and they are required by that right, law right. to provide the units. In right, right. No, no, I understand so. that. I'm just saying that, 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 that this is similarly getting an up zone to the housing element sites and within the housing element sites if you have an affordable housing responsibility within those housing element sites you can't pay an in lieu fee and then the units are built somewhere else you have to build the units on site which is what i'm saying is consistent with um the treatment of sb9 so another question i have is just um in terms of um i, I thought that sb9 said that these could none of these units that that are built um uh, built uh, pursuant to SB9 could be short-term rentals. Do we need to put anything in our local rules or ordinances just making that explicit? And how do we enforce that to make sure that, um, that none of these units become short-term rental units? That is also included within the draft ordinance. And um, when an application comes in for an SB9 urban lot split or two-unit development, we would do a covenant and a recordation against the title of the property. All right, and then we're, we're confident that we're gonna set up a process whereby we're able to, to verify or ensure that these units don't become, in fact, short-term rentals. All right, perfect. That Thanks. is correct, similar to our ADU ordinance, which um, prohibits short-term rental. All right, thank you. Cal thank you, um, Deputy Mayor. Council Member Lyons. I just have a couple of clarifying questions um, before we go to public comment. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't know that you pointed out that uh, utilities need to be undergrounded, and I appreciate that that was included in there. And I'm correct; it's in there, correct? Yes. So I wanted to make that point. Um, I wonder if you could go back to the map uh, that was the figure that you were showing, and uh, just for uh, our own clarification, maybe here in the room, um, I I wonder if I could ask a couple questions about it. I know it's really kind of small scale, uh, but if I'm understanding it correctly, when we have the wetlands, which are blue, and the flood area, which is light blue, and then we have the cross-hatched areas, that implies those areas are excluded. Those are the areas that are excluded, correct? Some may be excluded, but some may also still be eligible to, for development. So some of the, for example, the orange hash is the very high fire hazard zone on the map, so we would still permit the development there provided that they meet the fire code requirements. Okay, thank you. And then there are other areas that are different uh, zoning designations. Those are highlighted in different colors ranging from light tan all the way through orange. Uh, what about the areas that don't have a color on them? That aren't that don't have a shading on them. Those could be the multifamily residential zoned properties or um, public, semi-public. They just they have a different zoning designation that okay. is not eligible. Okay. All right. Great. Well, that's a good clarification for me. So I appreciate it. 
Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to Councilmember Kranz, and then uh, Councilmember Hensey, then we'll go to our five public comments. Oh, I, I take public comment. Well, before we- That's clarifying questions. Yes, clarifying question. How many uh, applications have you had submitted under the urgency ordinance? I know we've had several uh, staff advisory committee meetings, and I believe we may have only had a couple uh, actual applications be submitted. Wait, can we just clarify that? Because I had heard we actually had none. Like, we have had none. We've had questions, but we've had no actual applications. I think we've received our first one within the last month or two. That's, we, we have three active applications. As a matter of fact, we just received one today. So the last okay. time we reported out, we did not have any at the time. But in, in, since then, we have received three active or, or applications. Okay, thank so. you. And um, the waivers and and such uh density bonus law does not apply to these projects is that correct that is correct so there will be no waivers or concessions that are you know of of height for example that's the one that has most yeah yeah they, in, in order for a project to qualify for uh, a density bonus you have to provide a minimum of five right. units uh, in this case you're only allowed four um or actually two units uh, from, from a density standpoint, uh, plus two ADUs, so they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't qualify for What if there were bonus. enough land to qualify for that many units? Then, then density bonus does apply? So they're doing a split under uh, SB9 and proposing um, housing units that fit the uh, provisions of SB9, and then if it's big enough and there are enough units out of that project, then density bonus could apply. It's on, um, there's another provision in SB9 that the lots created as a result of SB9 can't be further subdivided. So from an SB9 standpoint, the underlying zoning would restrict the density. So for instance, if you currently have a single family or a R3 zone, you're still limited to the underlying zone if you're invoking density bonus. Okay, so, so if a uh, parcel is split in three pieces in order to accommodate an SB9 type project with the four units or so, um, they can't combine that project to say, okay, well, we now have six, or maybe there's a fourth unit lot and, and it becomes eight or whatever. That's each, each lot is then treated as a separate project and, and no longer could invoke density bonus. If I could, maybe approach from a different standpoint, you can invoke density bonus and then invoke SB9 after S uh, the density bonus project is final. And so if that's the angle that... Well, I don't want to get too carried away with hypotheticals, but I do, you know, and, and maybe there's nothing that we could put in our local ordinance that would you know, affect this possibility. But in the end, I, I, my hope is that we're not seeing kind of a double whammy, so to speak. And uh, um, so that's yeah. a concern. I think the, as far as um, one, it's um, to uh, Councilwoman Lyons' earlier question in terms of the map, SB9 only applies to single family zone properties. So when you subdivide those properties, the underlying zoning only allows you to have one unit per lot. SB9 is now allowing you to have two primary units plus two ADUs. So you're already exceeding uh, the density of the underlying zoning. So unless that uh, the resulting lot is would yield six or, or uh, five or more units, then there's a possibility that could invoke density bonus, but it'd be very difficult. It'll be a challenge. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member Hinzi. Thank you. So a lot of my questions were already addressed, but I do have a few more. And one is that I want to make sure, I heard you say that we won't be allowing short-term rental units in, in the ADUs that are created by this, but I want to make sure that we're also not going to be allowing short-term rentals in the principal residence that's required, because I've heard some people are skirting our ADU rules by living in the ADU and then renting out their principal home as an STR. And I, I hope we have specific language to avoid that. Is that, does that seem to be the case? That is correct. Both any unit as part of the SB9 
are prohibited from using it as an SDR. Great, okay, and then um, when do we, because the Coastal Commission also has to accept our ordinance, is that correct? Do we have any idea about the timeline of when they might be adopting this? Usually, um, it can take 12 to 18 months for Coastal Commission to act. However, they've been working, we've been working with Coastal Commission staff to um, prioritize projects, so we might be able to get it um, through their process next year. Next year. Okay. And then the final question, just for clarification, because it was so long since this was before us um, last time. So I heard you say that we, we would accept the principal residence, lot split, and an ADU. Are we expecting to see JADUs as part of this as well? So we'd end up with six units on each individual lot created? So we did specify a maximum of four units, so it would be any kind of mix of that. If it took a year and a half for the Coastal Commission to, to opine on this, does that mean that the urgency ordinance will expire? Or, and do you have to come back with an additional urgency ordinance? So we are, we are gonna be coming back in the next couple of council meetings to bring forth the extension to the urgency ordinance. And if, if we don't get approval by that time that expires next year, then we would come back again. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead with the public comments. The public and I will officially open the public hearing. All right, our first three speakers. Um, I'll call you three at a time and a reminder that you do have three minutes. Wait, hold on a second, uh, Council Member Kranz. I wanted to clarify this urgency ordinance need because of the length of time uh, the, the uh, LCP will take to be approved. Can the urgency ordinance be our proposed ordinance? So that some of these additions and changes and Im improvements that I'm seeing uh, would, would be in effect or does it mean that we're at the mercy of the Coastal Commission for those additional protections, the short-term rental uh, you know, language, some of these other things. We've got three projects that in theory at least are, are being processed under the urgency ordinance which doesn't have the enhancements that we're seeing through the Planning Commission process and the, and, the, and the public process that we've gone through. Council Member Kranz, um, currently the urgency ordinance will expire um, December 31st, I believe. Um, these, these provisions clearly are meant for the regular ordinance. The urgency ordinance, the way I understand it, was adopted pursuant to the moratorium rules um, with extensions for a good cause and so forth. The issue and the need to study. Um, if this council directs, the staff could look into um, including some of these provisions in the urgency ordinance. I wouldn't advise it because I don't not, I'm not clear, we haven't looked at it yet, if there would actually be an urgency to include these in there. Um, I think the better course of action is to just extend the urgency ordinance as it exists, if needed, um, until Coastal Commission appro approves this. If Coastal Commission approval um, does not appear like it's gonna be likely in any, any reasonable time frame, I think we can revisit modifying the urgency ordinance if there are facts to support that. Yeah, because I see, you know, I mean, just the, for example, the affordability, the, the deed, you know, the deed restricted affordability in perpetuity is not in our urgency ordinance. And so while we're waiting for the Coastal Commission, um, we will miss that opportunity. So maybe we can pay an extra fee to get it expedited through the Coastal Commission or something. I, 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 I'm concerned about that. Well, also, the emergency ordinance is not actually agendized for tonight, right? So we would need to come back for a modification to the urgency ordinance. But it seems like we should definitely do that, I mean, based on what you're saying. And we should have it looked at by legal. That, that is correct. Uh, we're waiting for uh, the council's action tonight. Uh, the urgency ordinance is due to expire December 15th, so we are scheduled to bring forward the extension of the urgency ordinance on the November 9th uh, agenda. Okay. Okay, let's hear the public comments. All right, again, I'll call you three at a time, and you do have three minutes. Bill Welch, Scott Campbell, and then Cindy Cremona. Bill Welch, 25-year resident of Cardiff, east of the freeway. I'm not sure why we're even doing this here tonight. All the questions that I just heard clearly reflect, you don't even know what this thing is all about yet. There's no hurry to pass this ordinance. 
The state has shoved this down our throats. Many municipalities are fighting back. The law is being put to the test in the next election by a people's initiative. Just slow down and take some more time to study this thing. We had a proclamation tonight about the perils of no water, and we finished with stack and pack them with more people during a drought. Uh, it, it astounds me. I don't think you even have jurisdiction to be doing this. Proposition A told you, and votes before that, that changes to the general plan, especially one of this magnitude that guts the core tenets of the general plan, require a vote of the people. Again, I understand what Sacramento's doing, but you don't have to placate Sacramento with these kind of actions. I guarantee you that if the people actually knew what this ordinance was about, they would tell you overwhelmingly they don't support it. When I test my neighbors out walking the dog about, have you heard about SB 9 and 10? They have no idea what it's about. The few who actually do think, oh yes, it's another ADU addition, let's go for it, it's just granny flats. These are subdivisions. These are gonna require new parcel numbers. They're gonna require new assessments. What happens to my property when all of a sudden it goes from R4 and around me, all the R4 turns into R8? How does that affect my assessment and my property value? Four-foot setbacks with two-story buildings. Can you imagine tucked into the corner, right between two other houses, looking down at their pools, their backyards? This is craziness. This is not what I got into when I made a contract with the city, i.e. the general plan. I plopped down a bunch of money, bought a house, thinking and knowing that my neighborhood would stay relatively the same. That's what the general plan is. So there, there's no point to actually pursue this at, at the present time. And again, I reiterate, you have so many questions. I wondered about a three acre, four acre parcel. You can split it more than four times. This law doesn't prevent that. There's many parcels throughout the city that could end up with six or eight lots on what was primarily an RR1 zone lot. This is also gonna cause huge disruption with neighbors. Neighbors are already fighting with each other over this. Thank you, sir. Do you have jurisdiction? You. Do your constituents want this? Thank you. Um, Madam Mayor, may I ha take a moment and give a response? Uh, what, I, uh, what I'd like to clarify uh, before the next speaker, um, there was some confusion from people who are sending emails today too. And so I just wanna be clear to everyone in the room that this is not, what's on the agenda tonight is not us accepting SB 9. That's not on the agenda. The, what's on the agenda is how we can protect ourselves and our community character because SB 9 has been established as a law across all of the state of California. So it's been established as a law across all of the state of California to, for all of the cities. And so we're trying to get ahead of it to say, all right, now we know, they've told us this, these are the rules, but let's see how we can protect ourselves so that we can m manage this in a way where any of the, any of the projects that come forward blend the best way possible with our existing city. So that's maybe a nuance, but it's a really important nuance. That's what we're trying to do here, and it's not whether we accept SB9. It's how we can manage it so it works best for us. I hope that helped clarify. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you, for everybody's benefit, that that's clear. Good. Go ahead, Scott. Okay, um, my name is Scott Campbell, and I live in the Acadia District. I'm an Encinitas resident for over 27 years. Um, thank you, council and staff and law enforcement for showing up tonight. Um, yeah, it's nice to see you guys did some nice due diligence on this, and the questions you asked were good. They're very good. Um, you missed some stuff, though, and I'm gonna ask you to, to uh, delay this. Um, there's questions that I'd be asking. 
Um, let's just you know, go down the list here. Section 3018-040 uh, about rentals in the previous three years. How will you know? How will the city know? Are we going to hire somebody full-time to enforce this? Um, section 30.18.080 about the short-term rentals that uh, was mentioned. But once again, how will we know? And if, and if so, how long will it go on before we can actually do something? What is the restitution? Will we get all the back rent? Um, these are, you know, enforcement is a big issue on this. I and mean, we can say it's illegal, but we actually need to have enforcement and actually penalties. Um, section 30.18.110 about affidavit of occupancy. This one's kind of interesting. What if the ownership situation changes? What if the owner becomes ill? I mean, or I mean, forced to move by a job. And this is, I don't think that's enforceable. Um, section 30.18.050.A.12. This one is great. It talks about separate gas, electric and water connections. Uh, keyword gas. Didn't we ban gas in new developments? I think this would qualify. So this is quite interesting. This should get taken out. It's not a huge thing. Um, section 30.18.07, um, in perpetuity, it was mentioned by several of the council members. Once again, how are we going to enforce this? There's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a barkless code amendment. It doesn't really do anything. It, we need enforcement on how we're going to check people. Um, they also mentioned acting in concert. So if I... Uh, talk to Kevin Cummins over some beer in our fire hazard zone, a uh, higher fire hazard zone, how we were going to pull this off. And we just happened to do a development next door to each other. I mean, how are you going to know that? It's kind of ridiculous. Um, I can't blame the staff for not finding answers to this in my industry, a highly regulated one. If nobody asks the questions, I don't put it down in the documentation because it just it means more questions for me to answer and more work. Overall, this is a good document, and, and Councilman Lindy's actually was kind of on spot. It does help the city. It does protect us. But I wish you would actually go on record of opposing SB 10, 9 and 10 on public record. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Next speaker is Cindy Cremona, followed by Dennis Caden and then Karen Caden. Good evening. Cindy Cremona, Lucadia resident and candidate for mayor of Encinitas. It's a sad day for local control in Encinitas. Control over zoning is why Encinitas became a city in the first place. The county of San Diego was issuing building permits willy-nilly. Residents were sick of land use planning by remote control. So in 1986, we became a city. Fast forward to today. Where was our challenge to SB9? Where was the strongly worded letter? Where was that tooth and nail fight to defend local control? Today, our housing element identifies how Encinitas will shoulder its share of affordable units. Sadly, your policies require that big projects set aside only one in five units as affordable. Your policies pave the way for Encinitas to become a big city. SB9 rubs salt in the wounds. Neighborhood character already is under siege by infill development and high density zoning you have created at 15 locations. No one has answered how Encinitas will meet the demand for public facilities and services this kind of development will bring. And now, like mold on bread, development by remote control can spread throughout our residential neighborhoods. Thanks to SB9, one lot can be cut in two and developed with four primary residences. What does this mean for neighbors who just want to live here in the nicest city in Southern California? SB9 won't impact newer developments. The easy targets will be larger lots in older neighborhoods. When hit and run speculators begin snatching up property and throwing together four packs of buildings on single family lots, what will that mean for neighborhood character? What will it mean for our quality of life? Do not introduce Ordinance 2022-17. Table your action today. When a new mayor and city council are seated, perhaps they will be more willing to defend local control.
Hi, I'm Dennis Caden. Um, the staff said on Prop A is not applicable because, the, according to Encinitas Municipal Code, Section 300040, <clears throat> does not require a public vote because they do not increase the number of units that may be constructed on any property. Excuse me, isn't this about getting more units on pieces of property? So I don't understand that. I see our population being increased dramatically from this thing. <clears throat> uh, there's also the water shortage. <clears throat> so where are we going to get all this extra water with SB9's consequences? Uh, Sacramento Scott Weiner stated that homes do not use water, people use water. And according to the U.S. Geological Service, the largest use of household water is to flush the toilet. After that, take showers and a bath. The Encinitas uh, Climate Action Plan report states clean water is an essential but limited resource that is expected to be strained even further through projected drought conditions in uh, changing climate. So where are we going to get the water? And according to UC Berkeley's Turner Center for Housing Innovation, SB9 will produce 700,000 new units within the state. That's a lot of water we're going to need. How many additional new people will be consuming one of our most, according to our, our climate action plan, a limited and strained resource. With no desalinization plants being built or on the horizon, why should the Encinitas residents lessen their quality of life by reducing their water usage only to enable additional new residents to consume what we're sacrificing to save? Parking. SB9 will ruin our community with more cars parking on already crowded streets. <clears throat> uh, they claim that if a garage is taken down, then you only have to build uh, one parking space. So we used to have two parking spaces, now we only have one. Seems like we're going in the wrong direction. Um, and then, like who in Sacramento is calculating that only one person with one car is going to live in these units? Setbacks. According to the Development Services Department, uh, setbacks may be reduced to four feet from the side and rear property lines. That's an interesting distance, four feet. Because last year, I remember having to stay six feet away from everybody that I came in contact with. <laughs> SB9 is an egregious insult to Encinitas and all the cities in California who wish to decide for themselves what land use decisions are made to accomplish the desired community's character. Would you please fight for Encinitas, fight this legislation, doesn't have to be done now, uh, well, you don't have to pass it now, and with other cities who have the guts to do so. Thank you. I don't really want to be here, but everybody's here, and I, I know um, we're being watched on TV. You're all being more watched since last week. So here's what I got to say. Please slow down and think of your beach town. This is up zoning. We want our city council in favor of a resolution in support a ballot measure that provides more local land use control over our zoning changes. SB 9 undermines our property rights. We have lost confidence, trust, and the integrity of our representatives to preserve the quality of life. Encinitas residents have worked hard to provide for our families and to buy into single-family neighborhoods, zone, not multi-buildings. SB 9 changes our peaceful living, lose our privacy. SB 9 will definitely evermore and stress on our existing infrastructures, schools, streets, safety, and our well-being. More building structures built on split lots with zero to four feet from property lines is intrusive. No more backyards or side yards, less open space for trees, gardens, play, less play, less wildlife. There will be more traffic, no more parking somewhere, 
noise pollutants, more use on our sewers, water, energy systems, and we're going to need more fire assistance and more sheriffs. Senator Tony Atkins is SB9 author and has support Blake Spear to run for state senate, and we are asking our council to fight this bill. We are the people who made this city to incorporate for local control. Why are we never heard by this council? We pay your salary, we pay the staff salary to represent and keep Encinitas character. Do not destroy our loving, beautiful town. Please be brave for us. Say no to drafting SB 9 into an ordinance or into our general plan. We are against urgency ordinances just for one or two applicants? What are, who are we? Chicken liver? Mayor, that does conclude uh, public speakers. And then we have one speaker, Jennifer Hewitson, who is in opposition to the recommended action but does not wish to speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to the public speakers. I just want to make uh, one preliminary comment. So this uh, law has been in effect, SB 9, for 10 months, so since January 1. And we have had, just in the last couple weeks or one week, we've had three applications. So this is not that we are, what's I think clear is that this is not something where there is a rush to use the SB 9. Um, opportunities, and in part it's probably because of the limitations that we saw on that map of which lots are available and uh, the financing and all the things that go into making these decisions. So we have approximately 25,000 homes already in the city of Encinitas. So having three applications for a maximum of four uh, times three is 12. So this would be adding potentially 12 homes to the city. So it's important to recognize that the Turner study, which um, was widely uh, quoted because it, it evaluated the entire state, how many lots are actually available to use SB9, coming up with 700,000 across the entire state. The bottom line was that it is a modest addition of housing, SB9. So I know there was a lot of, um, uh, anxiety and angst and hand wringing over the effect of SB9, but uh, in this city and I think in many cities, it is it is going to have an exceedingly modest effect on the overall number of homes we have. So I appreciate the work that's been put into the emergency ordinance or into the the permanent ordinance, which will be going forward to the Coastal Commission. I think there are some good things we should talk about directing into the emergency ordinance if we do need to. Um, to, to make that something that lasts longer. Um, and so, you know, I look forward to my council members' comments on these things as well. So I'll go ahead and call on you, Council Member Kranz. Thank you, and while I appreciate that, uh, that data point about the number of units that will actually, uh, that appear to be um, proposed and, and it will be quite limited, most likely, um, the reality is that if you live next door to one of those sites, that there will be an impact, and, and, and you know, that's unfortunate. Um, but I think it's important to be super clear about what we're doing, what we did with the urgency ordinance, and what we're doing with this one. And I would like to be clear by asking, if we didn't adopt the urgency ordinance and we didn't adopt this permanent ordinance, would that stop applications for SB9 splits? No, we would be defaulting back to the state law. Right, and so under state law, if we didn't allow these SB9 projects to proceed, we would be in litigation probably quite quickly. Um, that's, a, that's a good guess, I would say. Likely, yes. And um, the likelihood of prevailing in a lawsuit like that is very, very low. And so while I think people want to you know, fight, uh, the reality is that a majority of the people in this city don't want to waste money on lawyers. And so um, we're doing the prudent thing, the thing that I think protects the city the most, 
which is adopting an ordinance that has the additional provisions that um, were outlined tonight. So um, I will support this. I will move that we approve, make staff recommendations. Okay, thank you. I will second. Uh, Council Member Lyons. Yes, thank you. Um, I think our job tonight is to look at the details of this uh, proposed ordinance, which will help us manage how we uh, implement the SB9 to see if we've captured enough, to see if we've captured what we've talked about in the past, ask questions about what else can we do. And so that's what my line of questioning to our city staff is going to be. Um, First, I wanted to ask, I, I see that um, as far as excluded property, the conservation easements are identified, and I think that's great, but I also want to ask the question, does that include um, other kinds of easements that might be called environmental easements or, or other kinds of easements that might have a different name than a conservation easement? Or is the term conservation easement used to imply all of those kinds of, of uh, properties set aside for conservation? And I say that because I've drilled down as to a lot of the different types of set asides and easements where we have in open space, and they have different names. So I just, I'm thinking we're we're trying to capture all of those, but I I don't want to assume unless you, unless you can give me some clarification. It, the requirement for conservation easement is a broader requirement. Uh, the wording in the ordinance uh, specifically states that lands identify for conservation in an adopted natural community conservation plan. Uh, so that's the, the premise. So if you're referring to um, sp open space easements that are on private property, those are not, those, they do not fall under this provision. Those are not applicable. So Given those are not considered conservation under this, under the law. Okay, so given that, how, how else are those areas protected? How, I'm not quite sure how else to, answer the, to ask that question. Uh, those are open space easements, as you just named them. Um, are those, can those remain open space easements or? They, they would continue remaining as open space easements, but they, it doesn't preclude that property from invoking SB9. Doesn't include the property, but yes. the easement will stay intact. Yes, the Thank easement you. will remain. I'm happy to hear that. And it takes council action to revoke the, or to vacate the easement. Okay, good. Um, I have a question about parking surfaces. We are requiring two parking um, spaces per the two units. Can the parking spaces be a permeable uh, material? Can, can, can it conform, can it help to contribute to the permeable space, the 75% permeable, permeable space on the lot? Yes. Okay, good, thanks. Um, kind of in a similar way, sorry to drill down on some details, but now's my time. Um, we're identifying private open space and we're calling for private open space to be a minimum of 100 square feet. Uh, my thought about open space, well, it says external, so outside. My thought about open space is something more landscape based. Um, it looks like something like a balcony would, would do for this private open space. Could you shed a little bit of light on what the expectation is there? I think there's a little, like, maybe a little more definition around what is expected from that private open space? Yeah, so the code section says specifically that the open space be provided on the ground floor for units that are on the ground floor and then the outdoor deck space for a second floor unit would be counted towards their open space. And it's, it's more for like activity areas for the residents to have space to be able to enjoy. So balconies can be considered private open space for ground floor units. Is that open space um, included in the um, landscape area? There's a expectation for a certain amount of landscape area. Is that open space included in that or, or is it additional to? It's an addition, but okay. it could if the private open space also meets the landscape and provides landscape areas as well. Oh, okay. So That wasn't clear, but it could. thanks for that. 
Um, and I did want to mention that I appreciate that you've integrated our comment on the per pervious um, uh, treatment surfaces to be 75% um, of the surface area. Am I understanding that right? Because there were a couple percentages on permeable surfaces. That was maybe for the 800 square foot units? Yeah, the, so under lot coverage with the 800 square foot residential unit, the pervious coverage shall be at least 75% of the remaining lot area. Good, thank you. Um, thank you for um, including our comments associated with the, adding the landscape, adding the stormwater uh, management, and also addressing the affordable housing. And that's it for my questions. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Lines. Deputy Mayor Mosca. I think it's important to clarify that that, as was already stated, that that last year when the state legislature passed SB nine and the governor signed SB nine, it allowed the cities to basically do a little bit of tweaking of how this is applied. Um, so they basically said that you know there are differences among the 480 cities throughout the state of California, and so therefore there's some room for you to kind of tailor this to the uniqueness of your community. And so I think what you're what you're seeing over the last year uh, is this city council, the planning commission, and the public really kind of working you know and grappling with how do how can we and I understand that some people don't understand or appreciate or care for SB9. But how do we actually implement SB9 in a way that it, we're actually uh, managing it to the, to the greatest extent possible? And so that's what we've been doing. And the absence of doing that, if you do nothing, as people say, you know, a lot of folks come up here, local control, local control. And what that means to them is do nothing. Do absolutely nothing. And if you do nothing, as has been advocated tonight, then, then you're in a worse situation than you would have been had you acted. And so what your city council is doing is putting its best foot forward. It's basically trying to tailor an ordinance uh, that we, uh, we, we understand that, that there are a lot of people that don't care for, but we're trying to tailor this ordinance to make sure that, that it's mani we're managing it to the greatest extent possible. And so I think that, that we're doing a good job. And, and I'd say that Scott Campbell again tonight came up, let me, let me just quote him, because this is the second time in a row. The first time, last time he said that you guys got the housing element right, right? After he saw what happened in Santa Monica, Santa Monica does nothing, does nothing, local control, do nothing, right? And it defaults. What happens? Developers can come in and do whatever they want to do, default, right? Tonight he says, it does protect us. Council Member Lyons is right. It does protect us. So thank you for saying that, Scott, because it does protect us. And only saying local control and doing nothing does not protect the city. It actually puts us in a worse situation. So I will support this. Thank you. Let's go ahead and vote. And just to be clear, this is to introduce Ordinance 2022-17. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the round of applause. Um, does the council want to take a quick break or get to the next item? Next item, okay. Um, 10B is award of construction contract for Pacific View. Drum roll, please. Yay. Okay, let's uh, hear from staff on this. How many public speakers do we have on this item? One? Okay. Oh, here comes Mark Wisniewski with a comment. <laughs> There's no time to issues. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, you can start. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of Council. Tonight before you, we have the Pacific View Site Project Construction and Construction Management and Inspection Contracts. The staff recommendations tonight are to authorize the city manager to execute a construction contract with Conan Construction, Inc., also to authorize the city manager to execute a construction management and inspection contract with Kleinfelter Construction Services. After the city went ahead and authorized, city council authorized us to do the 
specs, plans, and bids for the Pacific View site project, we did that. We ended up with seven bids for the construction of the Pacific View site. Conan Construction was the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, coming in at $4,559,500. We also went out and did construction management inspection services and an RFP for those services. We had three uh, firms that went ahead and put in proposals. We went ahead and evaluated those and determined that Kleinfelter pr did provide the best proposal and would meet the needs for this project. We have different construction cost categories. So the first is the actual construction contract is $4,559,500. We will do a 20% contingency for this project in the amount of $911,900. Our construction management inspection contract with Kleinfelter is $800,000. We have a CMI, CMNI contingency in the amount of 15%, which equates to $120,000. We also have utility company fees, which our architect talked about, um, and that might be any type of water, sdg &E, um, type of cabling, things like that. We estimated that at $75,000. So our total estimated construction costs for the project come in at $6,466,400. So that includes all the construction, all the contingencies, and all the utility fees. And to let uh, council know, uh, we currently have left in the budget for this project $6,475,850. So we have a little over $9,000 to spare. Um, so first of all, um, I also want to talk about the timeline. Um, if the contracts tonight are approved, construction will begin in winter 2022-23, and the estimated completion for the project will be July of 2024. A couple of other items of interest. Uh, we are working with the arts community and the public to work on the color palette as directed by council when we went for design. So Travis Carlin will be helping with that and we'll be engaging our arts community, including um, our arts commission on that as well. Um, I do want to um, give a great big thanks to the city council um, for all of their hard work on this project and moving this forward. The city manager, again, as I always say, for finding us the funding. The community for their never ending support of this wonderful facility that we hope to bring to fruition um, after tonight. A great big thanks to all the staff, as I said last time, for the quick turnarounds um, and the amazing work they did. And then core um, group, which was Jeff and his group who did an amazing job with design. Uh, we're very excited to get this project underway if it is approved tonight. And um, with that, I will take any questions. Could you just briefly explain what the project will do for the benefit of the public and, and the council? Um, sure. It will go ahead and provide the necessary improvements to the building, which include electrical, glazing of windows, HVAC, heating, plumbing. One of the biggest things it does is it brings the building up to ADA so that it's compatible. Um, so this building will meet all of the codes. It also will meet Title 24, which is energy requirements as well. Um, so again, this makes this building completely usable in every way, shape, and form. Okay. And what will be um, the plan for planning the programming inside of the building? Uh, the programming, um, if you recall, on February 16th, uh, Royce Powell, our Development Services Director, brought forward the permitted uses that are currently allowed under the zoning, which are arts and culture related and recreational activities. Um, so the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Arts Department um, has been working um, with uh, several of the arts groups and have come up with some preliminary uses. So they are under arts and culture, um, and they will be refining those um, over the next year. Uh, one of the things this does not include yet right now is FF&E, so we will look for furnitures, fixtures, and equipment, um, depending on the activities, um, but it will be all arts and culture related, as well as being able to hold some events there. Okay, thank you. I see Councilmember Lines has hand up, but should we hear the public first? Yes, yes, go to the public first, thank okay. you. Okay, let's have the public speakers. We do have five speakers now, so I'll call you three at a time, and just a reminder, you do have three minutes. Michael Schmidt, Mark Wisniewski, and then Rachel White. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Blake Spear, uh, Honorable Council members, the public and city staff, everybody here. Um, I just wanted to speak in favor of this as a Lucadia resident, although I'm on the Commission for the Arts. I do not tonight speak for the full Commission of the Arts, of course, uh, on this matter because we haven't talked about it specifically. But uh, we, of course, in the past have 
uh, issued proclamations in favor of your support of Pacific View, and we very much enjoyed working on it, and I hope that you will vote yes on it tonight on uh, this construction contract and keep it moving and keep the public involved. And I just have the greatest hopes for this um, for, for this art center, and I thank you for all of your hard work on this. Good evening, council members, Mayor Blakespear, members of the council. This is a long time coming, so I thought we'd take a little trip down memory lane. How about that? It is not graceful, and it makes one hot, but it's a blessed sort of work. If Eve had had a spade in paradise and known what to do with it, we should not have all that sad business of the apple. Using the spade is what we did. We had to excavate dirt, a lot of it, in order to put in straw bottles for erosion control so the city wouldn't get fined for having water and soil leave the site. And the soil had to go someplace. And that's uh, one of my crew leaders in the back there, uh, Russell Levan. I think you see, under, recognize the person in front. And this guy is one of the guys who moved the soil all the way uphill. And then we use that to retain uh, water on the site by creating berms. And this was our first uh, uh, picture for our first work party. Uh, my co-supervisor, uh, Brad Roth, who'll be talking to you later, he showed up even though he had had an accident and had to use a walker. And then in the front row, second from left, uh, we see Councilman Joy Lyons, who uh, originally started a design team of landscape architects and design professionals, uh, and then became the project uh, landscape architect. And this was the second work party, and you see a lot of the same faces. We had a number of uh, citrus trees, uh, 20 of them, uh, donated by Bill Halbaum. And uh, we boxed them up into 24-inch boxes. And they're still sitting on the site, being maintained, looking for a home. It was a dark and stormy night. First poppy bloom of the year. The gophers love our poppies. One of the citrus trees, first year, we got 424 kumquats from two trees that we used on site. We planted wildflowers. Come on. And we had a visiting hawk. A lot of birds foraging in the, uh, in the wildflowers. Oh, giant swallowtail butterfly, bird poop caterpillar. They blend in real nicely there. We had 23 of them on one uh, tree. Katie Dids, painted lady butterfly. They flew by in the thousands when they migrated. Always a lot of weeding. But you make new friends too, young and old. Excuse me. Thank you. Let, let's give Mark another minute to finish his slideshow, because I know you put it together for us. So go ahead. So young and old. Uh, Three-year-olds can learn how to spot particular weeds and then show their moms and dads where they missed them. Mina Seth, she was a high school girl, a sophomore when she started. She's a senior there. And I was able to write a letter of uh, recommendation that got her into the uh, American University in Paris, France. Our contributors. This is what we did. Three years of work parties, hundreds of volunteers, thousands of volunteer hours, 100,000 estimated value of volunteer hours, and $6,000 of donated plants, mulch, and other materials. Part of the thousands of hours was due to this lady who, uh, she lived at Oceanside. One more minute. 
<laughs> okay, one more minute. She lived in Oceanside, showed up at the first meeting, and said, I've got a vision, and I've got the energy and the people to make a major contribution. I'll let her tell you about the contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I wonder if we're thinking about already how we can actually celebrate and recognize all of this, all of these hours and all of those folks like Mark that have put in time, countless hours to this project. And we, we obviously, as we construct it, we wanna make sure that we're some way recognizing and remembering all of the hours and all of the, the contributions that have been made. Hopefully we can do that. Deputy Mayor, I am sure we can find a way to do that. Next speaker is Rachel White, followed by Brad Roth, and then Kathleen Lees. City Council of Encinitas, very hardworking and dedicated staff, volunteers, and public. I want to say this is a long time coming. Mark is very humble and very generous. Um, when I learned about Pacific View from Scott uh, Chatfield, I, we, we walked by the site and I was like, well, what are you guys gonna do here? He was like, well, we're trying to save it. And when we had the first work party, I showed up and asked a lot of questions. And my first thought was, well, we have a lot of Bible study groups who look for community projects. And so I went to my church and I said, is there any Bible study groups who would just like to come and help pull weeds? And they looked, they thought about it, they looked around and they came back to me and they said, give us more information about this project. At the time in 2017, North Coast Church every two years has a major community give back where we give back millions of dollars throughout San Diego, North San Diego County particularly. And to date at that time, I don't think we had get anything major in Encinitas. And so they came to me and they said, would you be the project leader on that? And I said, yes. And being the only woman in the group of all men. I had to find everyone who had a special gift and talent for building, um, converting, and there's, there's, there's often a, a, a statement that says, he who speaks first loses. And so that's the negotiation. And if sitting in a room full of men and everybody's sitting back waiting to see who was gonna be the first person to open their mouth, I said, darn it, it's gonna be me. And I said, we got to get this started and we got to do it now. So I lose, let's move forward. And we got it done. It was an amazing project. 2023, we have another giving year coming up. And I've uh, been trying to look at and locate sites in Encinitas. Um, I have been tasked lovingly with um, helping out with what is going to be a potential homeless shelter in Oceanside, which is the biggest project that I've ever been asked to do. But I am going to recommend a site in Encinitas and help train an up and coming project manager and co-lead. I wanna thank you. Please continue to talk to people like Mark and me. Please continue to talk to the people who gave without getting anything in return. I wanna see Encinitas have a professional small box, 99 seat theater where we can do play readings, where we can do dance recitals. And I know that that's contentious, but don't forget about the Japanese garden. Don't forget about the art studios. Don't forget that this is supposed to be for the working class, not just the well-to-do. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for your commitment and coming all the way from Oceanside to support this project for so many years. We're really grateful for your work. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Blakespear and Council. I'm Brad Roth and I, uh, I worked on this project along with Mark and Rachel and the rest um, for three years and uh, Rachel didn't mention that the project that she organized, they painted the whole school inside and out. And uh, it was huge. Two, two. Two days. Two days. A whole bunch of people worked. Uh, so um, a bunch of us worked the, for about three years. And it was um, organized by the Institute of Arts, Culture, and Ecology 
Alliance. And uh, Garth Murphy headed that up. And then after three years, the city kind of, to our thinking, pulled the plug on it. And there was some complicated uh, things that went on. I, I never really understood why why it, uh, city called a halt to it. But the effect on all of these people who volunteered was um, we lost confidence in the city government um, and the, the integrity of the process. We went through a process, the group to organize it was chosen publicly and um, then, you know, all these people worked all this time and, and, uh, and, and it was stopped. And uh, I, I lost track of what was going on. I just was I, I too tired to care anymore. Um, this council's better than some previous ones, but a lot of us lack, uh, lost some trust in the, in the city government and the process, and it makes people hesitant to get involved when that sort of thing happens. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but some comments on the construction plans. I looked at them briefly. They're very, not well organized. There's no table of contents. You don't know where to look to find out information. And um, uh, that, that would help. Um, there were some specific um, comments I had on the plans, but I don't have time to talk about them. But uh, thank you for moving this ahead. And uh, thanks to all of you who helped. A lot, a lot of you were there volunteering. So thank you. Good evening, all. Kathleen Lees, I live in Lucadia. And uh, because I'm on Lucadia Town Council, we got involved with this very early from the time there were first hints that the school district was gonna unload the property. And so, well, as you all know, when, when you're involved with things around the city, things happen and you get noticed and then they get bigger and then they kind of die back. And so uh, 17 years to build Olympus Park. And I thought, you know, that's, maybe that's just how long it takes. Tony's been on council, and it took him 10 years to get speed bumps on his street. So you just, when you say, you know, government is not the fastest way to get things done, you, you have proof of that right and left. But uh, this is 12 to 13 years before we're going to be walking inside Pacific View, and it's going to be functional and usable. And I think that's so exciting. I'm on the board for the Encinitas Friends of the Arts, and we are already digging places, digging into places to bring money to pay for the um, F, F, and E. I have to remember what that is, furniture and stuff. Also the landscaping, because none of this money, money covers the landscaping. But it's going to completely regrade the back guard, the place where the school isn't, and put in a parking lot there. So that will all, it's all going to be functional, and we can do the rest of it from that. And I don't, I've never started an uh, arts center before, but I, from, it has to grow from the community. There is no guideline for starting an arts center. You, you, it comes from the community, and I think that's what held EF up, it, the, the other, everything up, that and all the other stuff. But, you know, there, it needed to come from more of the community than was being resourced at the time. So I'm really glad to see that we are resourcing the community. And, um, it's just a start that we get to pick the colors. You know, the colors are like the least important thing <laughs> in this whole, this whole project. But this is not um, ever a project that's gonna be completed because we're creating a living thing. This is gonna represent the community and we'll probably start out having a dance studio in there, but maybe that isn't what we have 10 years from now. And it's, there are people who have wonderful plans for making it into a performing arts center, and maybe that will happen too. But you have done the big thing. You bit off the, 
you know, the, the apple in the Eve, the Eve story. You've bit the apple. You've picked the apple for us. And now with the apple going, we can, we can move forward. We can pull together people getting to know each other, sharing their ideas. And there's a solidity to it that gives us a basis to move forward. So thank you so much for doing that. I thought I was giving my minute, three minutes to Mark, so I didn't plan to say anything. So I probably just babbled on. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. That does conclude public speakers. You never, never babble on, Kathleen. It's always pearls of wisdom. Um, I'm so grateful for the speakers who came out tonight to speak on this. Um, you know, this Pacific View has always really motivated the heart of our community and people to speak and volunteer and, and find community and connection and to see the best part of ourselves. And so I'm so thrilled that we're able as a city to put 6.4 million behind this. And I really thank the city manager for finding that in the budget and our, my city colleagues, all of us feeling united in that commitment. It's really fantastic. And I think as Kathleen said, and Brad referred to it, that you know there was a, there was a period where it wasn't exactly clear what was happening and it became a little bit adrift. But I think individually we all wanted it to happen on the council and we also wanted the community to carry it if they could. But some very real realities of city owned property and litigation risk and potential zoning changes and the direction and the funding needed to make all of that happen, really the city needed to come in from the bottom and give it its foundation. And that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, but without that, you know, it might still be a drift and likely would be. So I really, I do see that the city, it's city owned property, the city purchased it, the city having our the general fund money going to help make this a successful part of our city is really what needed to happen. And I'm totally thrilled that we were able to do it in this calendar year um, and that the city was able to move so quickly when we made that decision at our last budget meeting that this was going to be the thing that we put the money into. So um, along with other really important projects like Streetscape and El Portal that we were able to accomplish this year. This is so important to us and we're having a groundbreaking uh, if we pass it tonight on this weekend and I hope you'll say a few words to the staff will about what's expected and the time associated with that so that people know about it. Do you want to just jump in? here and share that. Thank you, ma'am, Madam Mayor. Um, if tonight the construction contract and CMNI contract is approved, we will be doing a groundbreaking at the Pacific View School at 1 p.m. on Friday, August, uh, August, October 28th. Um, we will have council there. We've also um, asked representatives from the Commission for the Arts, NCS Friends of the Arts, and Encinitas Arts, Culture, and Ecology Alliance to speak and to have a shovel. So we're very excited. So again, if this passes tonight, um, folks, please. Please come to the groundbreaking at 1 p.m. Friday, October 28th um, at Pacific View Elementary School. And um, we will have, um, you'll need to park on the street if you do come, but we'll have that and we will have refreshments as well. Okay, great. Friday, not Saturday. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, so let me call my colleagues here. Councilmember Lyons. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to thank the passionate and eloquent speakers who came to speak on this item and who have just supported and really helped drive this forward over the years. And, and I feel like we've, we've figured out how to put it, put it together and move it forward with this very important first step. And it's a, um, it's, it's a milestone, but it is just the first step. So every time I have the opportunity to talk about Pacific View, I want to take that opportunity to remind people that this is just to get it able to be occupied. And it's amazing, and I'm so happy about it. But there's so much more we need to do. I'm hoping that this fosters some real energy and some momentum behind us being able to find where the funds are, to move forward into creating the outdoor gathering spaces. This is city open space. This is Pacific View. This is history. This is everything all in one bundle. And we have so many dreams and aspirations for what to do on this property that um, I just want to see it all happen. Outdoor gathering space, outdoor visual arts, outdoor performing arts, um, education gardens, you know, um, just um, historic gardens, historic 
plant materials. Uh, there's so many opportunities. So uh, we will use this momentum to keep on moving forward and look for where those opportunities are. And I think we can go from strength to strength. And I think that's a, a good foundation for us to start with. Um, I do want to thank Mark for his long, enduring passion for the landscape. <laughs> and I, I want to make a suggestion, and I don't know, I haven't asked you about this in advance, Mark, or, or the city, but I know those citrus trees, you never intended to, them to be in those, um, those boxes for so long. So I don't know if you would have a recommendation if there's something we should consider at the city. You don't have to answer that now. But um, if there's something we can consider having to do with the citrus trees that are in boxes, we should talk if it's better for them to be located in a permanent location somewhere. Um, I do want to say that now that we're going to go into a construction contract, the whole site is going to be secured and the vandalism will be managed. And I'm going to look at Jennifer when I say that because I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that's how this is going forward. I, there's been a problem with the vandalism, so I want to touch on that. Thank you, Council Member Lines. Uh, yes, the site will be secured. There'll be additional fencing, um, and it will also be up to the construction um, contractor as well to secure the site. And the nice part is there will be activity, which there is no activity now, so there'll be a lot of activity. But we do want to mm -hmm. make sure that the building is secure and safe. Great. Um, another thing is, I know we're going to do ongoing coordination with the Historical Society, but I want to go on the record of saying we need to do ongoing uh, coordination with the Historical Society, which is on the property, and um, you know, just make sure as far as whatever their activities are and whatever the construction activities are. Maybe you have a few th words on that today, too. Yes, thank you, Council Member Lyons. One of the reasons we did choose Kleinfelter Construction Services was their outreach plan and how they would um, involve all the stakeholders. Um, so absolutely. Biggest thing we want to do is make sure that all the neighbors, um, and yes, Carolyn over at the Historical Society, is kept aware. Um, also, her site will be completely secure, and it will be out of any type of um, construction zone. But that's one of the reasons we chose them, because of the wonderful outreach and the communication skills that they have. So that was one of the primary reasons for choosing using Kleinfelter Construction Services. Great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, before I pass it on, I want to take the opportunity to move the approval of this item. Second. Uh, Council Member Krantz. Thank you. And uh, this is a milestone that is really important. And uh, I look forward to the completion of this work and the opening the cutting of the ribbon in 2024. Um, it's really great to be at this point. Um, but the effort that went into keeping the facility alive, so to speak, will, does go to the folks that are here in the crowd, plus many, many more. And I want to express my appreciation for all the efforts that you put in, especially Rachel and her, um, her faith community that came out and put in the tremendous effort um, to, to, to paint the building, EACEA, uh, -E paying for the roof uh, repairs. Um, you know, these were all very important efforts to get this building to the point where we're now ready to uh, rehabilitate it to the degree that this project will. And, um, you know, it's looking pretty shabby right now, but I can't imagine what it would look like if we hadn't had those efforts by um, Rachel, your team, and, and, and EACEA volunteers, many of whom are here tonight. So um, thank you for all of that. And uh, needless to say, I will be supporting the motion. OK, excellent. Well, let's go ahead and vote. Yay, it's unanimous. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We just have one more item, and it's about trees, so some of you might be interested in this. It is an update on our mature tree preservation policy, or mature tree preservation, not policy. Go ahead, Roy. This is an informational item only. Do we have public speakers on this item? We do not. Okay. Okay. Good, uh, good evening, council members, mayors, uh, community members that are here with us tonight. 
a brief overview and update on where we are with our mature tree preservation ordinance update. Um, back in December 8th of 2021, the city council directed uh, city staff to uh, develop objective standards to preserve uh, significant mature trees. Uh, at that meeting, it was a result of an initiated item that council member uh, Krantz brought forward to the council. And as part of the motion for that item, uh, city council gave this direction. Uh, we've been uh, focusing on other priorities. Sorry, let me make sure. Apologies. Um, in October or since December 8, 2021, uh, staff have been working on other priorities, uh, council priorities. And earlier this month, we started uh, putting our focus on this effort uh, to initiate an ordinance uh, for the preservation of mature trees. Uh, as part of that effort, we uh, met with council members Lyons and Krantz on October 18th, 20, uh, earlier this month. And it was a, a very effective and productive meeting. Um, we received tremendous feedback uh, from the two council members in terms of some of the key features or, or issues that we should uh, consider when we're uh, analyzing and evaluating and creating the uh, ordinance. Uh, some of which is to clearly define the, what's considered a mature tree, uh, identify some of the constraints that would make it infeasible for the city to, or developers or applicants to preserve mature trees, and also identify ways to incentivize the preservation of mature trees. So I wanna highlight some of the policies that we currently have related to mature trees. So we have three general plan policies that addresses mature trees. One is the uh, goal three of our resource management that um, encourages the preservation of significant mature trees. We also have policy number 3.2 that prohibits the removal or um, disturbance of mature trees to provide public right of way of improvements if those improvements could be eliminated or uh, deferred, redesigned, or eliminated. And then the third policy is uh, policy number 3.6, which um, states that future development shall maintain significant mature trees to the extent feasible or possible and incorporate them into the design of the, uh, the development projects. Uh, the challenges that we've been facing as, as staff, uh, as you're aware, in order for the city to impose any standards, it has to be identifiable and it has to be objective in order for us to um, require applicants to uh, address or implement a standard. Unfortunately, in this case, um, these are policies that are high level, uh, that it's not fully objective. So the goal of the ordinance moving forward is to take these policies and develop objective standards that would support uh, these policies. The good thing is we do have one objective standard that is part of our climate action plan. Uh, as part of measure CS1 of goal 7.1 of our climate action plan that clearly identifies a uh, replacement ratio for any mature trees that are being uh, removed as a result of any development. Uh, the replacement ratio is one to one, so that objective standard is being implemented and enforced. So any project that is proposing to replace or, re or, uh, or remove any existing mature trees are required to replace it at a one to one ratio. So next steps, um, we are in the research and analysis phase. Uh, we have received some of the feedback from our two council members, and we're also looking and evaluating other local agencies and other agencies in the region uh, for their, if they have any mature tree preservation ordinance. And we're gonna uh, hopefully adopt some of the of their standards uh, based on the feedback that we received from the, the council members, as well as the issues that we've faced over the years. and. Um, and then identify some of the um, provisions in those ordinances that would apply to us. And then also identify and resolve some of the conflict uh, in regulations. So some of the challenges that we're facing is um, housing laws, state laws, and then we also have stormwater regulations that are stringent, that is state law, and those um, could supersede any local effort to preserve any existing mature trees. Um, so that's part of our effort right now is to identify ways to uh, first identify what those conflicts are and then figure out a way to um, address those in our 
uh, new ordinance. In addition, uh, it's important that we identify some of the potential impacts of the removal of these mature trees, whether it's impact the ecosystem, uh, in impact the air quality, to promote and encourage the preservation of mature trees. So that's another thing that we're gonna be looking at as we're evaluating uh, other local ordinances. And then last is uh, how can we incentivize uh, the preservation of trees, whether it's through uh, additional uh, standard uh, waivers or uh, maybe design review uh, or a more stringent uh, buffer or I mean a replacement ratio. Uh, we currently have a one to one replacement ratio, perhaps a three to one or a two to one replacement ratio uh, would incentivize the preservation of trees. So those are some of the things that we're focusing, we're uh, working on right now as staff. Um, and then the next step is once we um, gather all the, the ordinances and start a preliminary draft, we're gonna hold a community workshop and get the, the community's feedback. And then based on the feedback from the community, that we'll finalize the draft and then we'll present it to the, uh, our Urban Forest Advisory uh, Committee group uh, for their feedback as well and then based on the feedback we received, we'll develop or uh, finalize the final draft that we will be presenting to this uh, planning commission for their feedback and recommendation, and then we'll bring that forward to the city council for your consideration and final approval. So that's where we are with the mature tree preservation ordinance, and we're available to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, council Member Lyons. Yes, thanks. Um, thanks, Roy. Uh, I want to make I want to emphasize a point, and that is that we're looking at preservation of mature trees on both public property and private property. So, um, in our own areas, in our own owned property, as well as for private development. So it's really two pronged, and uh, I will be working to encourage us to really think outside the box as far as mature trees instead of instead of just identifying them and say, oh well, the utilities have to go right where that tree is, so we have to take that tree down or the stormwater basin has to go exactly where that tree is, so we have to take that tree down. I'm gonna encourage us to think kind of broader than that in how can we save that tree and also accomplish our other goals. And I think that's a question we have to ask ourselves every time we look at our mature trees because unfortunately they end up at the very end of the pecking order and, and really I want to elevate them so that they can help to drive our decision making. Thanks, Roy, for the summary. Okay, uh, there's no public comment on this item. Councilmember Kranz. Yes, thank you, and I do appreciate uh, the update. Um, I know this is a, a very important issue for all of us um, and the community, so um, I want to thank Jedidata Stuber for um, his, his feedback and pointing out that Austin has a a pretty uh, objective standard for saving mature trees, which involves the measuring the diameter of the of the trunks of the trees to determine whether they need to be preserved or not. And so, um, I look forward to an analysis by city staff of of what Austin has done. So, um, I think it's really important. I uh, spoke with somebody today who pointed out that our arborist, uh, our tree maintenance company that we contract with, West Coast Arborist, was at uh, Glen Park, one of the oldest parks in our city. It was a county-built park. I played there as a, as a kindergartner. And uh, there's a lot of mature trees in that park. And unfortunately, we, uh, an, an, another arborist, a private arborist, I spotted some tree maintenance that was really, in, in his opinion, not necessary. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have with the way we maintain our trees is that we, we tend to over prune. So in addition to these issues related to development, I think we definitely need to double down on our efforts to avoid uh, doing damage to our urban forest um, with uh, over pruning and, and some of the other things that, that uh, we see um, because of, you know, I'm not sure what's causing it, but I think that it is important that we maybe revisit our urban forest policies and make sure that we're reinforcing 
um, those policies that are in place in order to protect our urban forest. So thank you again for bringing this update to us and I look forward to the continued development of this particular policy. Okay, thank you. And I'll just make one comment from the presentation that you just made. You know, I don't think taking down a mature tree and saying if you have to put in two or three or even five or seven or ten trees is actually going to be a deterrent for any developer who's clearing property and saying, you know, we're not going to preserve these trees. And, you know, I, I always think back about the ficus trees are really... We had a lot of really difficult conversations, and thankfully, we ended up preserving our ficus trees and not going forward with some removal project for them, which are historic trees in the city. Um, and But I always think about the tree outside the potato shack, where it's like, it's this scraggly little tree after the ficus tree was taken down, providing no shade and no habitat for birds and you know nothing that really adds any character there. And so, yeah, the idea of, of, of requiring a, a couple additional trees, just I, I don't feel like that's an incentive really at all. So I just want to say that. Um, but also, you know, to Councilmember Lyons' point about when the city is in control of some of these things, where does the utility box go? Where does the stormwater go? You know, we, on these public property, um, it, it does seem like we have a lot of ability to reprioritize re trees higher up. And so to still get those things accomplished, but not, you know, not have to have it be that zero sum game where the tree always loses. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's just no replacing, especially some of these big trees like the Torrey Pines and the Eucalyptus and some of the historic trees that take so many years to grow or are historic and are not being replanted like Eucalyptus, which are never replanted. Um, so I, I do hope that we move forward with this and the council moves forward with this in the future and continues to prioritize it. Uh, council Member Hinsey. Thank you. I saw Russell submit a speaker slip, so perhaps he's willing to share some wisdom with us. Um, well, I'll just say before I hear Russell's wisdom, um, one thing that I've heard often from folks I've met with who have rebuilt a home is that our stormwater requirements or the drainage requirements are such that it's easier for them to remove the mature tree than it, than it would be if they left it and then reconfigure the system around it. And somebody, it was probably Russell, pointed out to me some years ago that the tree is doing a lot of that drainage work. The tree is sequestering a lot of the water on that property itself. So how can we find a way in our code when somebody wants to redevelop or develop that that tree can be considered as part of their, um, their stormwater management? Um, and then Mark Wisniewski was so kind uh, to take Joy and I on a tour through some of our city parks and Cottonwood Creek and identify some places where we could have mature trees, but there's just been one or two things done wrong, either at the planting level or, as Councilmember Krantz pointed out, at the the treatment level that keeps them from growing into a beautiful mature tree. And my impression up until that time was that we're doing a stellar job and everything's perfect, but it seems like from Mark's much respected uh, perspective, there's a lot more that we can do. So I, I hope that we do those things and revi revise our policies as needed, like when we you know, are gonna be doing Pacific View and having landscaping there, how can we make sure that the trees we, we plant there have a a fighting chance to live to be hundreds of years old. So that's that. Okay, well, let's hear Russell's comments. Go ahead, Russell. Mark took me on that tour too a while ago, so it sounds like he's been, <laughs> he's been given that tour for a while. Good evening. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, as you could see, but you tempted me. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm hopeful that we consider, and I know this is what part of the discussion, future mature trees. So when we're planting, we ha always have tried to keep that in mind, but I want to realize that, you know, in 50 and 100 years from now, those mature trees that we're planting today, and hopefully that we planted 10 years ago and 30 years ago on Coast Highway, are going to be part of this legacy. So every day that we're planting a tree, some careful consideration as to, you know, when someone runs a tree over when they're on Coast Highway and for whatever reason they slam into a tree, um, all of the considerations that go into planting a tree and the future trees, I think, need to be kept in mind. Um, I don't know if any of that made sense. Um, but I know this will. 
We have a website link coming soon. I'm not sure when, but it will show some of the mature trees that unfortunately have had to come down. And occasionally that is important to understand why. And so I've spent a lot of time out documenting when they cut down a lot of these trees on Coast Highway. And it's amazing how many comments are thrown at the people standing or doing the work, yelling at them for cutting down these trees. And it is crazy. I beg them to come back at the end of the day and see what we find at the bottom of the tree. And I sent a picture out today of one tree that was cut down a few months ago where two feet of the diameter of the tree was completely rotten. And I've been meaning to bring this material to show you. You can crumble it in your hands. That's holding up a 75-foot tree that's only three feet in diameter. So if the center of the two feet of, of the trunk are rotten, and it gets worse as you go down into the ground. So this fungus is growing up from the soil, and it's infecting the roots. And so occasionally, you have to cut down some of these trees. And if those people came back or realized if it were next to their house, they'd be begging you to cut it down. But when it's in the public right of way, they complain. So I think education is key here and uh, uh, realize that some mature trees will have to come down, but that's why we need to plant new ones to have future mature trees. That's my comment. And look forward to that, that link. I think it's going to be really helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Russell. I have something I want to bring up here, which is the mature building policy preservation, but I'm going to bring it up in just one second after we make sure we, uh, we go to the public comments. Uh, so we're going to end this item. And then I, so Roy, if you could stay so that I can bring up this that Carlsbad's doing for mature, mature building preservation. Um, but so let, we'll, we'll end this item as informational item and let's go back to public comment now to see if we have any people who are still here wishing to comment. Again, this is for oral communications. I'll call you three at a time. Scott Campbell, Kelly McCormick, Jennifer Hewitson. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the, um, the speaker slip on the back, community communications guidelines. It says I was called out. I'm going to take a little bit of um, liberty on this right now. Um, Joe, you missed the point. I don't support SB 10 in any way, not in any perspective, but I got to work with the game that I got. And you guys missed the point. We're setting ourselves up for failure to comply with these open-ended requirements, but there's no teeth on it. Um, Mayor, um, I saw you dramatically put on your scarf and it looks nice, but I hope you realize what that scarf represents. There's quite a few other women and even a man in here wearing scarves. And you know what? They all were against abortion, strongly against abortion. So I actually applaud you for joining these other people with their symbol symbology. Um, I missed my chance to talk about uh, uh, Section 8I. There's a typo. You talk about um, a sidewalk from Orpheus Avenue to La Casa Avenue. That's to be an engineering miracle. Um, I did notice the new DG next to the bridge. Thank you. Um, I asked that the council take the funds for the roundabout and move them to um, railway at grade crossings. It's been done before. Uh, 2017, Tony, you took um, $300,000 and put it to the El Portal. So we can shift money around. Um, the contract with Rail Pros. I don't want to wait until December 2024 to get an update. Can we get an update on that? Um, the temporary parking on the east side of 101, the temporary DG parking, it's temporary. What are we going to do? This is going to come up. We need to start thinking about this. I've noticed uh, um, all these disclosures that the council has been making. Like, I went and visited the site. I read the information. Does that have anything to do with the closed meeting earlier today in litigation? I, I, I'm really curious about that. Okay, here's a good thing. I actually um, downloaded the information from B Cycle. I made a request for it. And there's a lot of information there. And it is making money. Ugh, it is making money. 
it's about 5% of the money that we have made on cannabis applications. It's not making very much. And, and if you and put the cost of the bikes, it's probably making none. Um, there's some interesting data points. There's a significant amount of uh, trips that have 18 exact miles. And also zero miles and zero minutes. Interesting stuff. Um, did I cover it all here? I think so. Oh, yes, this um, postponing us till the end. Former mayors Dallager and Stocks would be proud of that. They, they did that before. In fact, Dallager even pulled up, I'm going to go home and go to sleep to get this kind of stuff to go. Thank you for your time. Before you start, I'll just clarify that for the six years I've been the mayor, it's always been the policy, and I inherited the policy that we do 30 minutes of public comment at the beginning, and if there's more than that, we take it at the end. We usually don't have more than 30 minutes. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Good evening. My name's Kelly McCormick. I'm a public health educator with San Diego Alliance, and I'm a parent in the San Diego Unified High School District. This is officially Red Ribbon Week, which is why I have a red scarf. And great things have been happening in Encinitas schools to highlight this year's red ribbon theme, which is celebrate life, live drug free. Over the entire month of October, all nine Encinitas elementary schools have been participating in red ribbon activities, along with the middle schools and the high schools. Depending on the age of the students, the focus is on making healthy choices, raising awareness about the harmful effects of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and drug use, including fentanyl, and the stages of brain development, making young people more susceptible to addiction and harmful mental health outcomes. It is more important than ever that we recognize and celebrate children and teens who are living drug-free and amplify the positive messaging around the drug-free lifestyle. The tobacco and marijuana industries are doing their best to get kids hooked. I don't want them to win. I would especially like to recognize and thank the dozens of high school students who participated in Teen Presenters this year. These are high school seniors who are drug free and always have been. They visit sixth grade classes and middle schools to encourage younger students to remain drug free. Kudos to them and to all of those who recognize that Red Ribbon isn't just one week or one month, but an everyday commitment to good health and good choices. Thank you. Next speaker is Jennifer Hewitson, followed by Geraldine Kessler, Rachel Graves, and then Sophia Machado. Hello, Mayor and City Council. Jennifer Hewitson, Wotan Drive. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak and for all the times that you have listened, heard, and responded, especially to those of you who will be moving on. It is greatly appreciated, and I want you to know that. And thank you for the tree ordinance update tonight um, and moving forward to protect trees. Much appreciated. Um, California state laws and threats from HDD I'm sorry, HCD, has Encinitas so afraid of lawsuits and therefore so fixated on housing as the only solution for all of our ills that we've lost sight of all else, of why so many move here from other cities, of why we are as we are, of what it takes to remain this place. What has become of our values of nature, beauty, calm, our sense of what it means to be rich? We talk of climate action, open space acquisition, tree protection, thank you for that, all important, but then you take a property on Encinitas Boulevard with rare wetlands, riparian habitats, and endangered species and designated an R30 site where massive apartment buildings are planned and density now trumps endangered. The land is seen as not viable habitat, too fragmented to bother with, no connectivity, but it is a watershed. It is trying to connect to Cottonwood Creek. It is disconnected because we allowed it. The last straw is to bulldoze it. I stand here and ask you to pause and consider the value of the spaces in between. The key to our quality of life has been those spaces. SB9 will not help us. I, I was spurred to speak tonight because of a recent mailer from the Nature Collective asking for donations to support bus rides for kids who cannot access nature, a good cause. But I ask why 
are we not doing everything in our power to keep nature in their neighborhoods? What are we missing? An acre here, half acre there, a narrow corridor in between, and we have it. Walkable wildlife preserves, connectivity, open space. Every time we allow a developer to destroy habitat and mitigate by throwing money to buy some elsewhere, we lose, our kids lose, and quality life is lost. One of the most biodiverse regions in the country, and California is mandating its own destruction. Sadly, they have convinced you to take us down with it. Please stop, map out remaining open spaces, create an ordinance stating that all projects must retain adequate open space, corridors, and connectivity. Provide incentives for developers to do this. Oh, and please raise the bar. Balconies are not open space. Um, every neighborhood can have nature on their doorstep and life, uh, a life of connectivity, not isolation from nature. There will always be time to build, but the time to acquire open space is running out. Thank you very much. I would like to speak about the proposed environmental housing nightmare density bonus project on Melba Road that is slated to take down a grove of mature Tory pines, 175 trees, 30 smaller trees and native shrubs. Also demo three beautiful historical homes built in 1938, along with an administrative building on the property, all based on the ill fated density bonus law AB 2345. I have been sharing this issue with the city for almost three years now. I was so excited to learn that Encinitas had both an urban forest advisory committee <coughs> and also a wonderful goal-oriented, sorry, environmental commission. As I listened for almost three years, I really truly felt the commission with its forward thinking could really change the outcome of this environmental nightmare project along with assistance from the Urban Forest Advisory Committee. I sent them weekly and monthly updates about the project along with a beautiful tree survey on the property done by a well-respected arborist in town. <clears throat> I told you several times about how stressful this project was is for the longtime tax-paying senior residents that abut this property. The loss of their tree canopy, which they simply looked out the window during the pandemic, and can constantly be reminded of this and how they were not able to age in place peacefully due to the impacts of this project will have on this unique senior population. The project borders the last rural horse farm in Encinitas, a preschool and Oak Crest Middle School and Park. The park is home to rare and endangered plants and species. The property also serves as an unofficial wildlife corridor that has been well documented by the community. There are also can a connection with the botanical garden in that the prior owner of the Melba property also owned the botanical gardens and sold it to the Larrabee. Anton was also a founding member of the San Diego Water District Board and responsible for the bond that supplied water from Lake Hodges to Encinitas, hence establishing the Encinitas as a flower capital. The property is a rare and special gem in the community, which could also serve as an outdoor STEM lab for the middle school with its close proximity. But let me tell you, what I got from the commission in the urban forest, where, where we are powerless about this loss of trees, on your, try on your own and work with the city. The urban forest would like to approve the entire row of trees on Melba as a grove of heritage trees, but the owner of the property had a sketchy land survey done that reflects three trees could be private property, although the city has cared for the trees for many years, and all my maps reflect these trees are in the city right away. They are also the same row as that beautiful Monterey Cypress that was just designated as a heritage tree. <clears throat> so the update is the project's moving full steam. The 200 trees and the beautiful historical homes are demoed and the tree loss will be on your watch. The city seems to be able to get plenty of funds for overpasses and hardscapes and loans for streetscapes, but why hasn't anyone assisted the community with basic tree preservation which aligns with the climate action plan? And guidelines with the urban forest advisory policy. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. 
It's nice to go after the meeting. Good evening, notorious 5-0 council. Uh, mentally ill vagrants running around town attacking people and we're sending letters to Sacramento supporting euthanasias. We won't even perform on farm animals. What's important here? Your only campaign platform, Catherine, or the people of Encinitas? Tony, 10 years on council and the meeting before elections, you finally asked the sheriff to uh, address the crime downtown. Come on, man. Kranz, you claim we don't have the money to fight Sacramento, but you are running for mayor to intentionally straddle us with a $200,000 election to replace you. Do you think we should have to pay for you to move four seats over, or do you want to handpick your replacement like you handpicked those three? Blake Spear, 12 extra homes is a big deal to some of us next door. We don't all own five properties surrounding homes our mommies and grammies gave us. And Mosca, you mock citizens who support local control and our right to vote. You weren't even here when we voted for that, I don't think. You were elected to a local government position with local laws in place. And for those of you who are new here, you three, you three didn't grow up here. For those of you who are new here, Encinitas, we want local council members who protect our local neighborhoods. I think it's a good thing you're on your way out. And what I came here for, I discovered the existence of a local, uh, I have a school district liaison committee in April of this year. My mom told me about it since she used to work here. Does anyone listening know that this committee even exists? Not a single person I've asked knows about this committee because it's being hidden from the public, which is especially concerning as we watch scandal after scandal at our school districts. Six months ago, I requested a list of committee members and I was never provided with a list of actual members. I'll repeat that I would still like this list. I also requested that the committee meeting be posted on Encinitas Granicus with all the others. I copied the city manager and the city attorney over here. Are you guys listening? Uh, in my request for public access to meeting announcements, agendas, minutes, and audios, after six months and numerous requests, still nothing posted. My only conclusion is that these meetings are not transparent and something is being hidden from the public. The entire history of this committee. And so I attended the school district liaison committee on Wednesday to express my concerns. And during my public comments, one of your committee members laughed out loud at me. You were there, Hinzi. I think, Mosca, you were just walking in. And while I called her out, not one of the committee members nor the council representative said one word to her, nor did any of them apologize to me. No citizen should be laughed at for bringing concerns before your committee, especially when the wrongdoing is clear on the city's part and the concern highly justified on the citizens part. I realize the elected school officials laugh at parents in this town, but do they also do this to students and teachers? Mosca and Hensey, your committee's poorly managed. It's time for a roster change. And then is Sophia Machado? That does conclude oral communications, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'll just mention this article that was in uh, the newspaper yesterday, and its headline is Carlsbad Council OK's Mills Act Program to Help Preserve Historic Buildings in City. And basically, um, if, if a property is purchased, um, the new owner agrees to preserve the historic home if it's more than 50 years old and then pays a substantially lower property tax. So this is something Carlsbad is moving forward with. And it says at the bottom the cities that are involved that already have these, San Diego, Escondido, Chula Vista, La Mesa, Coronado, and National City also have Mills Act programs. So it doesn't mention Encinitas. But I brought this to the city manager's attention just now and she said we do actually have this in the city already. Um, so I just, uh, am, you know, I wanted to just make sure that we, are we, do we ever have any applicants? Is it, no, okay. Is there anything we can do to up participation in this? Part of the, the Staver project, you know, is an example of historic homes, historic trees, and um, it's, you know, something that occurred to me. We can, we can look into how we can, um daylight that program so that it's more open and transparent to the public that it is available to property owners that with properties that are 50 year, years or older that they could take advantage of that program. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, and it seems like however it was discovered that all these cities participate but we didn't show up on here makes me think that it's a lower profile in our city somehow. So I appreciate that. Um, okay. So I think... We are at the very end of the agenda here, so we have no council member initiated items. Do we have any council member reports? Council member grants? None. Hinsey. 
I will report that while I was on maternity leave, NCTD did go ahead and um, have an item that was pursuing their study, which would um, come up with the, the costs of making the whole corridor quiet. That's both for our corridor and the Sprinter corridor. Uh, nothing to report. Okay. Nothing to report. So what was the outcome of their? They just um, had to create the cost for the study and then send it out to be done because it was, we had been hoping it could have been part of like their budget. They didn't need to have the board approved, but it was more expensive than they thought. So they had to send it out. All right. Thank you. I also have nothing to report. City manager report. Yes, as was mentioned, I think by one of our speakers, the La Costa walkway, which is a quick build segment project of the pedestrian path on La Costa was completed. It fills a pedestrian gap by providing 200 feet of DG pathway from Vulcan Avenue to the existing sidewalk. So if you haven't seen that, check that out. Slurry striping on the 101 will be is finally coming back rescheduled starting tomorrow and also Monday and Tuesday. And to prepare, detour routes uh, have been posted, door hangers, e-blasts, et cetera, have gone out as well. If you're looking for something to do this weekend, as you know, we talked about Friday at 1 p.m. for the Pacific View groundbreaking. And also on Saturday at the Encinitas Community Center is Dia de los Muertos Festival, which should be, I think many of you are going to be um, speaking and be a part of it. And then for those of you who are waiting for the Maggie Houlihan Memorial Dog Park reopening, it will reopen on Monday at 8 a.m. It was being repaired and restored. That's can, it. Can I uh, say that it is a relief to see that pedestrian path, the DG pedestrian path between Vulcan and the railroad bridge, um, that's a area that's quite constrained. And uh, the one question that I had when I, I uh, saw that, which I hate if it comes across as nitpicking, but there's a mailbox right in the middle of the pathway. And I was wondering who owns that mailbox and was there no way that we could get permission to relocate that mailbox? And I don't expect you to have the answer to that question, but perhaps you could get back to me on that because um, it's a constrained pathway to begin with and having a mailbox in the middle of it just makes it uh, that much more of a challenge. Is it an ADA accessible path? Do you? No. Okay. So it doesn't have to go around the mailbox, because ADA. I mean, like you have to have enough room to go yeah, around no, it. Yeah, it's, no, it's 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 not ADA, and okay. but e even though it's not ADA, if there was a possibility to relocate, it's the only mailbox. You know, I mean, there's one property there, and you know, maybe it could have gone on Vulcan. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. City Attorney report. Yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to uh, give a brief report on AB two four forty nine, which amends the Brown Act. Um, at the request of uh, Deputy Mayor Mosca at the last meeting. So in short, AB 2449 amends the Brown Act to allow remote meetings by individual council members, most me remote meeting attendance by indiv individual council members on very narrow circumstances. Uh, as we know, AB 361, which during the pandemic gave um, the opportunity for local government to appear remotely while there's a declared state of local and state emergency. Uh, Encinitas, we did that briefly in, in June. We don't do that anymore. Some local governments still do that. However, that is going to sunset when the COVID-19 emergency, state of emergency, uh, sunsets in February. Um, there's always the background um, ability of individual council members, as long-standing rules under the Brown Act, to appear uh, remotely or by teleconferencing when they're out of the juris when they're out of jurisdiction, you know, traveling or so forth. But they go have to go through requirements to post. You know, to, to that has to be notified on the agenda where the remote meeting from. They have to post those meetings at the actual location. The public has to be allowed to attend at the location and so forth. Those, those rules don't change. AB 2449 adds an additional, two exi additional exemptions. Um, there, in order to invoke AB 2449, the, um, the local jurisdiction, the city, would have to have allow teleconferencing by members of the public simultaneous you know, live teleconferencing, such as Zoom or so forth, which allow public members of the public to have full access to 
uh, the full meeting. Um, if, that is, if that is satisfied and a few other uh, bells and whistles, then uh, under two circumstances, um, a, um, a council member could request for um, an emergency situation to appear remotely only, only for a limited number of times. That emergency circumstances would be a physical, a physical or family medical emergency that literally physically prevents them from being um, present uh, in person. That request has to be made to the city council. City council has to approve that request. Um, the other option is if there exists just cause for appearing remotely, and again, this can only be exercised a few, num few times a year, um, and just cause would be um, whenever there's childcare, an Ill illness, um, or disability, which prevent them from attending the meeting in person. But these are fairly narrow circumstances. Could I just ask, so you said that the public has to be able to fully participate via Zoom, but we don't have that capability, right? So does that preclude the council member from having a child care or illness related? Thing? There, there, so there are a few other ways that it could be accomplished, but it's technically fairly difficult to do that. So does that mean that we can or cannot do it here in the city of Encinitas? You know, I, I defer my comment on that without talking to IT first and seeing if there was, if there was some way it could be done. Okay. But generally, there has to be a live there has to be a live broadcast that the members of the public can participate, see, hear, and observe, and participate remotely. Okay, I think we should try to apply the law to the current circumstances of the city and get back to the council about whether it's something that can or can't be done. Well, I'll, we'll certainly discuss that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, city clerk report. No report. Assistant city clerk report. Sheriff report. No report. Okay, well with that, we are adjourned.